Welcome to another edition of AV Rant. I'm Tom Andre, Associate Editor of Audioholics, and I am here with... Rob H. Hello, everyone. And yes, I do realize that I mentioned at the top of the show last week that I saw Captain America in Dolby Atmos, and then we never came back to it. <laughs> I'd like to blame me for that, but instead I'll blame... I'll blame Rob for that. I'm going to blame we'll, Rob. We'll blame both of us, yes. So, really quickly, um, this what, is... What? A... Oh, what? What? Yeah. Let's not, let's not get not... crazy here. I mean, I know it's important. I know it's important. Let's at least give ourselves a chance to forget it again before okay. we jump right in. All right. All right. Fair enough. Uh, first of all, let's, let's do uh, Listener of the Week. Listener of the Week this week is Kevin. Kevin is, uh, it was nice enough to support the podcast by going to avrant.com and clicking on the Buy Us a Cup of Coffee button, support the podcast, and has done so through PayPal, and that is what keeps this podcast going. And now that we're using more and more bandwidth to answer more and more questions for longer and longer periods of time, we need the support. So thank you, Kevin. Yes, thank you very uh, much. Yes, this week we have tons and tons of listener questions. Yet again, thank you guys. Keep them coming. We will keep answering them. Uh, let's see. We've got stuff about... Uh, let me. I'm going to kind of... <laughs> flip through here. We got somebody's going to do an infinite baffle subwoofer. Uh, we can get him together with infinite Gary, maybe, and they can they can compare notes because uh, it looks like Zach's going to try to outdo him. Uh, this does not need to be an infinite baffle arms race. Okay, that doesn't need to be a thing. We'll go <laughs> back and explain. Actually, it's not actually Zach, by the way. He's just forwarded us some other dude's plans. So. Oh, okay. <laughs> Whatever. Zach's friend, we'll call it that. Anyways, it's, that doesn't need to be an arms race, and we will go back over with the infinite baffle sub again is again for those of you that have forgotten. eliezer has got some things to say about dust caps. I think it's mostly thank you. Abby's gonna give us an update on why her surround sounded weird. Uh, Michael's gonna thank us and is asking about some uh, where to get free HD audio sample tracks. Uh, we've got a listener from India, woohoo! Touching all the continents. We are and, definitely uh, international now. That, if we that weren't is already, that's official. <laughs> Rohan, is it Rohan? I guess we're going with Rohan. That's how it's spelled here, but maybe it sounds something. He's an engineer, and he went out and bought some speakers, and he did the thing he should never ever do <laughs> after you buy speakers. What is that thing? You'll have to listen in to find out. Uh, Will, yes, Liz is Will. Has got some questions about home automation, and Will, you should stop by after the podcast, one of our, lis our listener sessions, uh, question and answer sessions, because a lot of those guys are all about the home automation. I mean, big time. So you can get a lot of stuff answered there, but we'll touch on a few things for the podcast for all of our listeners. Rob did uh, something very, very brave. He visited a <laughs> listener at his home and came back to tell the tale, uh, which is great because you always hear these stories of crazy listeners. But our listeners are all sane and nice. And Paul was one of them, and Rob went to his house, and he's going to come back with some stories about his BUD, his big ugly dish that he's turning into an over-the-air antenna. Uh, Michael, another, is it different Michael or same Michael? Yep. No, nope, that's why I put a D on the end there. All right, Michael D has got some, some questions about audio in Zone 2. Uh, Ron's got some questions about speakers and how to compare them and the right way to do it. Jeez, uh, another Michael has got... <laughs> wow. Michael. I'm trying Talking to delineate with last name initials. Different Michael has got some things to ask about uh, acoustically transparent screens and how to make sure that his speakers are all level matched and whether or not to line up his tweeters. We've got a Tom, who's not me, who's in Australia and is also still not me and has got a subwoofer question and we love us some subwoofer questions. Uh, David's got a question about Darby, which is a, a, a video processing thing that is now on the new <laughs> Oppo Blu-ray players. So there's a video of me and Clint talking about it uh, from CDIA. I almost said CES. CDIA last year, uh, which was really kind of interesting. Uh, Kevin has got a question about stacking multiple speakers for one channel. Uh, and one of the Garys, of the many Garys, has got... I don't know if we're even going to This is Infinite Gary. Here. I remember... This is Infinite Gary. Yeah. Has got some questions about LED, LCDs versus OLEDs and uh, high dynamic range and all that. And Gary, eh, I would maybe not hold out too much hope that we'll actually get to you. We've got some vinyl questions <laughs> that were that were from like three or four weeks ago that we never got to and that we're keeping around in case we ever just run out of time. I mean, run out of things to talk about. And I 
three hour stretch. <laughs> yeah, it really sounds like it from this description of what's coming up. Yeah, yeah and uh, that those come for both uh, vinyl and high res stuff comes for both Abby and Gabe. And Gabe usually hangs out afterwards. So if you ever want to talk high res audio, Gabe's your man. And he's got a new camera from Logitech, which now makes him look like a real person. Before he looked like uh, he looked like a flip book. You know, they like like somebody take a, took a bunch of pictures of him and flipped them through. Uh, you know what I'm talking about? Flipbooks? No? Yeah. Yeah. It looks even worse than my YouTube feed, and that's saying something. So. It looks now worse looks than my like YouTube that. feed. My YouTube feed's the worst. What are you talking about, dude? <laughs> I have got to get a new computer. I've got to get some lights. My parents are complaining because they're living in my house, and they're like, you don't have any lights in here. I'm like, I got lights everywhere. They're like, but your bulbs are only 40 watts. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I got a lot of bulbs. <laughs> what? Like, I can't see anything. I'm like, oh. So, anyways, it's been actually really good having my parents. They fixed uh, my home theater ceiling, so now I'll be uh, oh, nice. I'll do a little little bit of painting, and I'll have my uh, I'll have my uh, my new, my ninety two inch screen hung instead of dealing with my eight inch pull up screen. Which, by the way, save my butt again. I'm telling you, <laughs> pull up screens are awesome. How to get in contact with us? You got a question? We've got answers. Rob at AV Rant, Tom at AV Rant. You got once again the website avrant.com, uh, facebook.com slash avrant podcast, and at first reflect for Rob and at AV Rant underscore Tom for me at uh, on Twitter. If you guys are on Twitter or 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 Twitters, Twitter, Twitter. No, oh, I, I don't get Twitters. Okay. Tweeters. 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 <laughs> uh, I didn't even realize it was. Right. Yeah. Tweeters doesn't sound right. All right. I guess we should go ahead and talk about Captain America. So you saw Captain America 2, and I, before we get into the Atmos thing, how did uh -huh. you like the movie? I heard the movie is awesome. Uh, yeah, I, I definitely enjoyed it. Um, I think I got hyped up a little too much. I was expecting maybe a little too much, and it didn't quite live up to that. Uh, but it's definitely very good, so highly recommended. Check it out. You will like it, it too. Was, if it wasn't for the raid too, that this would be the action movie <laughs> of the year. Yeah, no, I mean the action is really well done, and it, there's a lot of homage to other ones. So there's stuff that's very much calls back to like really famous car chases, really famous fight scenes, stuff like that. So um, the guys who directed this, um, they've done a lot of television and stuff. My favorite show, Community. They've done a whole bunch of episodes of that. Um, so I don't know they, if that really they, makes them. Like, <laughs> it makes them. Uh, qualified to do a Captain America movie. Well, I mean, they're, I they're community big, is pretty close. They're big, big genre fans, is the point. And so uh, that was quite evident in the movie. So if you're somewhat of a film connoisseur, you will enjoy all the callbacks to stuff that you will see in the movie. Well, but was it awesome? But was it awesome? Tell me it was awesome, because I really want to see this. I mean, it's totally worth seeing. I don't, I don't want to, like, yeah. hype it up over much, because I was hyped up too much. It's like, it's not, like, the greatest movie ever made. See, you're ruining good. it for me. Well, no, if you come in with the, that was expectation. It than, was it better than the Avengers? I heard it was better than the Avengers. Was it better than the Avengers? I still like the Avengers better myself. I did. <gasps> I did. Sacrilege. All right, tell us about Dolby okay. Atmos. Yes, so Atmos. So there's been a whole bunch of theaters in my area who have installed Atmos systems, and this one, I believe, had 45 speakers, not the full 64 that is possible. So they go they go all around the walls and over the top of you. Is that the way it kind of works? Yeah, okay. they have they have a, a row of eight on each side wall, a row of eight on the back wall, two rows of eight on the ceiling, and then five speakers across the front, basically, and four subwoofers. Are the are the, are the speakers stacked in the front of the room? No, they are not. They are left, That's center, right. To remember and for later on in this podcast. Let's talk. <laughs> so let's put let's put that on the shelf. We're gonna put a pin in that one. We're going to come back to that later in this podcast. All Go right. on. So, yeah, so basically this is a sample size of one. I've only seen one movie in one Dolby Atmos theater, so this is by no means a large representative sample. Um, can't say I was hugely, like, blown away by it. Um, the one thing that stood out to me, aside from, they, they of course, um, Dolby always does their little, you know, intro thing, so they used to have that Dolby noise that came in, and then they started doing the little thing with, uh, you know, leaves and drums and stuff like that. So now they have one, this is like this cute little conductor cartoon who comes in and sort of orchestrates sounds that go all around you and above you and fly around. So that's kind of cool. You get the discrete sound effects going over your head and all that stuff, and that works well. But the movie itself didn't exactly make a whole lot of use of all those speakers in the ceiling, so there wasn't anything majorly drawing my attention in that sense. And 
the biggest drawback was that um, dialogue was now, in certain scenes, much more difficult to understand than it normally is in a theater, which, for example, when they're inside of a large uh, airplane getting ready to parachute out the back of it, and you have quite a bit of echo and stuff inside because they're in this rather enclosed metal space, well, you get all that echo and ambience, that's all coming at you, and uh, now I can't really tell what they're saying. So... If that's so it was too real, is what you were saying, it's too real. Right? <laughs> yeah, almost, yeah. yeah. It would be hard to hear in that real environment, and it was hard to hear what they were saying in the theater. So, yay? <laughs> <laughs> Success! <laughs> wow! <laughs> Everybody's going to want this subtitled. This scene will be the most subtitled scene ever. Okay. Yeah. Well, so I can't we're, say we're it was exactly... Enough. We're going to chalk that one up to your, maybe your theater's not that great. That, that is entirely possible. And yeah, so I can't say that this experience made me want to run out and buy even more speakers to add to my ceiling in my already 11 speaker theater. Um, and I've already not been hugely impressed by the front height speakers anyway. So maybe height information just isn't my bag. And that might just be me. It's entirely possible. But yeah. I'll have to see more. I'm totally willing to see more movies in Atmos to get a better sampling. I'm willing to bet that they turned those, spe those surround speakers and uh, top speakers up too much. I'm willing to bet they did that simply Definitely because they be. wanted to try to make sure that they impress people with their height and ceiling speakers of stupidity. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I am not of the opinion that we need more. I mean, as somebody who loves speakers... I am not of the opinion we need more of them. I think <laughs> I was I was kind of dubious of seven point, and I still mm. am. I really don't know that we need seven point anything. I think we were pro probably just fine with five point. We're not all that sensitive to sounds behind us. And frankly, like Abby, we talked with Abby or about Abby or with Abby through emails. It's distracting. It's distracting when the sounds are coming from someplace other than the screen. I'm sorry. I mean, yeah, sometimes it works. You know, and like in certain scenes, I think it really works. Like the Doc Ock scene where he oh, yeah. breaks out is the perfect example of a perfect scene where it absolutely works. Horror movies where sounds are coming from behind you or whatever that scare you, that the characters on the screen are reacting to, perfect use of surround sound, okay? Perfect. I think we absolutely need that. Uh, most of the time, I think we're just fine having all the stuff coming from the front of the We don't really read the rest of it. I just don't <laughs> think it's all that important. Yeah, I think it distracts. I'm sorry. And, and frankly, as cool as I think it is, and especially surround sound music where you're actually sitting there and being enveloped in it, I think that that's great. Uh, most of the time, you know, the point is to be lost in the movie or yeah. lost in the experience. And if something takes you out of that experience, it's bad. I don't care if it's cool. It's still bad. It's, it might be a, a cool kind of bad. It's like, oh, the, there's a, a speaker above me who's making a sound. That's cool. Now I'm thinking about that speaker and not, and I just miss what they said on the screen. Yeah. That's a problem. No, I mean, I was kind of hoping with this whole object-based audio, the whole idea that instead of just saying, okay, here's a sound and I am going to put it in this speaker, which is the old way of mixing with channels, now with this object-based thing, you say, okay, here is this sound and I'm going to give it a set of coordinates, X, Y, Z coordinates, where it should be in space inside the theater, and now the system is going to calculate whatever speakers it needs to use to make it seem as though that's where the sound is coming from. That's what Atmos is all about. And I was really thinking, like, Cap Captain America, you know, he's throwing his shield all the time. I was kind of expecting at least one scene where, like, he would toss the shield towards the screen and it would, like, bounce around, the th you know, essentially the theater, right? ahead yeah. of him if he's if he's facing us from the screen. I was expecting at least one scene of that, and that never happened. So I was like, well, there's a missed opportunity. <laughs> Yeah, I uh, like I said, I think that the the best I the, the best thing that might come out of this whole Atmos object based thing is the ability to not care as much about where you put your speakers. You know, the ability yeah. to put speakers yeah. wherever you want, wherever you can in your home theater at home, and have the receiver do the calculating of what it needs to do with phase and everything else to get the sound to come relatively where it should be coming from. Yeah, for the movie. If we can do that, then I think that w that Dol Dolby Atmos and the rest of it will be uh, worthwhile. Yeah, just, just, right. just that quick little intro that they did with the little conductor cartoon. I mean, it did demonstrate that 
the object-based audio is pretty cool. You can have a sound and make it come from a specific point in space above and beside and behind you and stuff. So I think it can be done. It's just I think that Cap 2 just probably didn't take tremendous advantage of it. So once again, it comes back to mixing and mastering is more important than the format itself. Just having all those speakers and having it be object-based doesn't automatically make it great. It's going to require some work. So Yeah. I want to like harken back to when uh, Jurassic Park came out. I want to remind everybody about when Jurassic Park came out. They required that you have a certain, your, your theater have mm-hmm. a certain set of speakers. I don't know if it's the specific speakers or I just remember there being a deal like you, you, certain theaters weren't going to get the movie because they didn't have the right speakers or the right setup for it. And I'm sure it was mostly bass based. You know what I mean? <laughs> it had to have like enough bass and it had to be, have surround sound and that sort of thing. But I remember walking out of that movie theater and being absolutely floored by the sound. Mm. Absolutely floored. I mean I was floored by everything. I thought Jurassic Park was a great <laughs> movie. kind of wish the kids got eaten. i got to be honest. Mm. I kind of was hoping that the kids would get eaten but you kind of knew it wasn't going to happen because it's a movie. But, you know, I thought that was a great movie. I thought it was a great experience. And that, you kind of, after that, I stopped, I started paying attention to what movie theaters sounds they had, what mm. sound systems they had. You know, if it didn't say THX or it didn't have something DTS associated with it, if it just was a theater, I was like, I'm not going. I mean, who knows what's in there? It could be two channel. It could be mono for all I know. I'm not going in there. And I've gotten burned that way, too, before I'm like, oh, it's the cheap theater, it's the $5 theater, $2 theater, whatever it was. Yeah, we'll just go and check it out. I'm like, oh, my God. There is not a, not, it's not that there's not enough subwoofers. There's not a subwoofer <laughs> in this home, in this theater right here. Yeah, yeah. I, I do have to say, actually, this this was one of the best um, evenness of base experiences I've had in the theater. I think having those four subwoofers essentially in the four corners of the room in this Atmos theater, I I think that helps just like it does at home. Because yeah, uh, it, it was nice. I didn't have any uh, yeah. peaks and dips, yeah. I really, I, I have not, even uh, IMAX has not impressed me recently. I think I went and saw <laughs> 300 there. I, I, I When I went and saw uh, Avatar, I wasn't impressed. The bass is always an issue. I always get better bass at home, especially now with the two, the dual SVSs. Pfft, it's insane now. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up. All right. Now, uh, we're going to go through this list in order. So that means we're going to have to uh, wait on Paul. So we're going to get Paul's yeah. we're gonna get Paul's interaction with you and uh, how you escape from his dungeon basement uh, later on in the podcast. <laughs> I don't think Paul can actually speak. He comes on the – he does the after parties a lot. He picks his microphone. Up. He fixed his uh, microphone. He said he got it working. Oh, well, you were supposed to test it while you are there. So he'd come to the after parties and show us his chairs. That was pretty much how that worked, which was great. It was great. Comedy goal. All right, let's start with Adrian. He sends us his, us uh, greetings from Mexico. Hi, Adrian from Mexico International. He posts on our Facebook page wondering where we stand with home theater decor and film memorabilia collections. Uh, let's start with you, Rob. You're kind of a collector type of dude. You usually collect speakers. So. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm not the collector dude in the, in the you know collecting uh, collectibles and charge keys and that type of thing. I just buy way too much stuff and then sort of never use it and put it in storage. Um, yeah, I mean definitely, I think it's I think it's cool. I think if you're into it, uh, the home theater decor stuff for me probably more than the memorabilia stuff, just on a personal level. Um, I definitely like when people sort of outfit their theaters, uh, you know, with classic looking uh, posters and artwork and um, you know, popcorn machines and that type of stuff. I really like that because I like evoking the feel of an actual movie theater. So for me, total thumbs up. You know, if you got the cash, by all means. But it, I'd, I'd always put the cash first towards like awesome, awesome equipment, and the decor yeah. would come second for me. Yeah, you know, this is my problem with home theater. Like, you go into home theaters and you see like movie posters framed and on the walls and stuff like that, and I always think, oh, that's going to reflect the sound. That's gonna bounce. That's gonna bounce the sound around. That's get just a hard get surface. Get on some acoustic panels, man. You can have the printed or dyed right. acoustic panels. That's the way to uh, do it. Yeah, I know. You could do it with the acoustic panels. And there's these stuff. There's these many companies now will do this, where they they take and you send them in a picture, or you can actually pick from their selection of movie posters, which they print on the fabric. They wrap the fabric around uh, an acoustical panel, an absorptive panel, and they you put that, you hang that in your wall, and not only is it a movie poster. 
quote unquote, it's also a, uh, a sound absorber. So it kind of does double duty, which I think is cool. I've never had the money for that, and I've never, I've never really <laughs> wanted to do that. I, I've been like uh, one of the listeners, Dave, uh, who I have been to his house before for uh, many, many, many moons ago. He's, uh, he was, he's one of the moderators on the uh, Audio Hogs forums too. Uh, he, uh, he's a big collector of stuff. Like he. <laughs> He's got all sorts of, you know, lightsabers and like Hellboy's gun and, you know, little figurines of the Terminator and all this other stuff. And he just got all that stuff all over his his house and in his home theater. And I think it's cool, man. I think it's cool. It's just not me. Uh, I'm I I I guess the, the things I would put in my home theater personally are like those THX plaques, you know, oh, yeah. will be you know those DTS theater plaques, even if they weren't real, because you can actually get the real one. You actually have to have THX come to your house, a custom installer come to your house, and then certify that your system is up to THX standards, and they will give you a plaque. It costs money. I mean, I think even the plaque costs money, but <laughs> the, the, everything else costs money as well. And, you know, they may say, you need more subwoofers, or you need more of this, or you need to have THX certified that. But you can actually get the actual. I won't care if it's fake or real or whatever, because I've been to I've been to actual theaters that were DTS certified. I went, my stuff sounds better than this. Therefore, I can I can I feel okay by kind of mocking one up. But that's about the extent of what I would do. I just like my theater, my personal theater to be playing. I like when other people do it. Now, I do not like when people have theme theaters. Ah, right, where it's all about one movie or something like that. Like the Bat Cave, or it yeah. looks like the it looks like the 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 uh, the 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 deck, the command deck of the uh, Enterprise from the Next Generation, or something like that. I'm like, you put those chairs there because they were that's where they were on the home th- on the on the on the movie or whatever, and that's not how it's not gonna be where they sound good. You weren't thinking about acoustics, like anything that takes away from the acoustics or the the experience of the movie. I think bothers me, but generally speaking, like I'll you know. I mean, I don't expect everybody to paint their whole rooms black, you know, and put like carpet on their walls that they have at theaters. But at the same time, when you know you put life-size Terminators made of metal at your first reflection points, you get what's coming to you. I don't know. I'm sure somebody has that, not me. <laughs> All right. So I don't really care if you have that stuff in your home theater and you want me to tell you it's awesome. It's awesome. There you go, Zach. Uh, Okay, this is the he sent us an electrical engineer's website where he's detailing the infinite baffle subwoofer he's planning to build using 24 15 inch drivers. That seems a wee bit excessive. Yeah, uh, not only is it 24 15 inch drivers, but the plan that he's mocked up at this website is to use four drivers attached to like large basically four foot by four foot panels, or I think he said 40 inch by 48 inch panels. So he's going to have these big panels and then have four subwoofer drivers physically connected to each of these and then have six of those panels. That's and stupid. That's, yeah, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I, I, let me take that back. I shouldn't have said that. Okay. <laughs> he he's wants to... to yeah. Go he ahead. Wa- he wants... He wants to cross them over at 18 hertz. Cross them over to what? <laughs> to his already existing huge, gigantic number of subwoofers. <laughs> All right. Now, this guy's an electrical engineer. It doesn't say he's yeah. a speaker engineer or driver <laughs> engineer, so I don't really know. Maybe he is as well, and in which case he could maybe do this. But... You see, the, the, what he's planning on doing is he wires all these subs and then physically attaches them to this panel, and that makes the panel part, you know, basically the driver. It gives you a huge surface area. Yeah. That's pushing sound out in one big flat wave, I guess. It, it doesn't have... It's it's just physically on the front of these things. It's not like into another... Uh, it's just weird. Anyways... Uh, now you've just increased the mass of all four of these drivers in a weird way. You have no idea how well it's going to work. I can't imagine that this is a good idea. Uh, I'm sure it will effectively make sound. Well, I mean, technically sound, nothing audible if it's being crossed over at 18 hertz. <laughs> so it's just creating wind. It basically. is just moving air, yeah. That, yeah. Inaudible, 
So this is just for feeling. This is a man who would actually benefit from base shake. Those uh, base. Yeah. Bat, the, bat, the, were, they, were they called ass kickers? No. Butt kickers. Butt kickers. That's it. He would benefit. From, he would save some money doing butt kickers. <laughs> that's basically what he's trying to do, but without the. And know, to his entire it. room. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> all right. The, this is a humongous. <laughs> hey, I love base. This is a humongous waste of money. As far as I'm concerned, I'm the sorry. The transient response on these will be horrible. Yeah, it so will I mean, be. It it's... just will be. You are trying to take something that is basically two sheets of drywall, put them together, and use subwoofer drivers to move them back and forth. There is no way that the inertia of that is going to give you fast transient response. No, that thing is just not going to happen. Yeah, it's just going to be a big rumbly mess. I don't know. Maybe he knows something we don't know, and that's possible. It's possible he's maybe he's putting it together with like titanium or something. I really don't know what he's doing. Get an so, infrasonic fan, man. That's what you want. Uh, I mean, if you want to go down to one hertz. You yeah. can have one of those infrasonic fans, which makes about yeah. as like, much sense as this thing does. Anyways, all right, so let's skip this. I don't care about that anymore. That's that's lame. Uh, Eliezer just wrote to say that he appreciated our talk on dust caps versus phase plugs, and he thought that dust caps are uh, that are made to look like phase plugs, but aren't actually phase cl- plugs. If you remember from last week, a phase plug is that bullet-shaped metal doohickey that comes up the center of your driver. The driver goes in and out, but the thing stays sent, stays you know attached to the to the driver itself, whereas face plugs is just a dust cap. I mean, I'm sorry, desk caps are just a dust cap that, that just has covers that hole. Uh, th- there's some that the f- dust caps look like face plugs, but they move in and out because they're attached to the actual driver material. He says those are a bit like putting racing stripes on a crappy car, or may I add to that, flames on mm. like a Hyundai or Hyundai, as they say in Australia. That was for Tom. <laughs> Took me forever to figure that out. I was like, "What are they talking about?" And I saw it spelled. I'm like, "Oh, Hyundai." Uh, there you go. Yeah. So yeah. Like every letter. You're right. You're right, Elias. Or we agree with you 110 percent. Yes, that's very silly. Abby. All right. So we talked about her uh, speakers in the back. They she was using a wireless transmitter from her front to her back, which had an amp sort of attached to it or some such something, and then uh, and then that was for her back speakers. Uh, and she was there was something that was making a weird noise, and she wants to know what she thought it could be, what we thought it could be. What was it, Rob? Uh, well, first of all, one of the speakers she was using did have a damaged tweeter. So right there, yes, that will be making horrible sounds. If Generally it is a speaking, damaged tweeter. yeah, that's not a good thing. Yes, we that's not gonna no. Yeah. So she did figure that part out. Uh, replaced. Yeah. The speakers um, didn't get them repaired, but replaced them. She already had her eye on uh, some Focal speakers, the Sib satellite speakers, uh, which I like. They're nice speakers, good looking too. Um, so she replaced those. But after doing so, um, she still had it connected with the wireless system. And on one particular scene, she says in gravity, like the rest of the time, they're working fine. But there's one particular scene where, for whatever reason, in the movie Gravity, uh, she was still getting this horrible sounding distortion coming out of even the new speakers. So it wasn't just the damaged tweeter that was the cause of everything. Yeah. Well, was it, Rob? <laughs> well, uh, she did a bunch of experimenting on her own after we had talked about uh, being able to adjust the gain, uh, which is basically just boosting or cutting the signal, not the actual amplification of the sound, but just the signal itself that's being sent by the transmitter or being sent from the receiver. So she did a bunch of playing around, and what she found out was that, uh, first of all, she increased just the speaker output level. Like if you go into your AV receiver and you go into its speaker setup menu, you can adjust how loud each of your channels is. And so she went in there and basically turned that up to maximum so that the receiver itself was sending out the strongest signal that it could. Uh, That is going to the Amphony, which is just the company, uh, the Amphony wireless transmitter, which is at the front of her room, where her receiver Mm -hmm. also is. So she Mm -hmm. turned down the gain on the transmitter. So now the transmitter is itself sending out a less boosted signal, but it's receiving a louder signal from the AV receiver to begin with. And then she just toyed with the gain setting on the receivers, which are the little wireless units that are at the back of her room, which are powering her surround speakers. So she toyed with those until she had it level matched. 
So that's the way that she got all her speakers to be playing at the same volume level, uh, but by sending out a much stronger signal from the AV receiver to begin with. And with that, success. Um, so she was thinking that, uh, we can't prove this definitively, but she was thinking that she was getting a clipping problem, uh, which is something that we mentioned that, you know, these, these systems, these wireless systems that have a small little receiver unit and have the amplifier built into that little receiver, well, that is guaranteed to be a rather inexpensive, because this is not a tremendously expensive system, a rather inexpensive class D amplifier, which is one of the types that has no headroom, so when it clips, it just clips, and you get horrible, horrible sounding distortion, which can damage your speakers. I'm willing to bet, Abby, that's what, that's what broke your speaker in the first yeah. place. That yeah. That's what broke your first speaker was the clipping. Now, you didn't, it might have been very slight at the very beginning, or it could be that that speaker was old to begin with, and the, you know something was brittle in it or whatever, but you kind of, yeah, when you hear that sound, turn something off right away <laughs> and try to figure out what it was. But anyways, she wanted a new speaker. She got a new speaker. She's happy. She figured this thing out. So, yay. Yes, but this is what can happen with clipping. Now, she, yeah. did she tell us what exactly happened to the tweeter? Was it torn or was it... No, it, I didn't get the exact details, but yeah. Yeah, she said it was damaged. It just was not... It very well have somehow damaged the voice coil and the thing was... Yeah rattling or something, God knows what. All right, she also, uh, remember she was also looking for a center channel to match her two main speakers, which she cannot get a center channel for. She ended up playing with one of her own speakers that was, uh, it was a studio monitor. She is a recording engineer. Uh, so she uh, had one, she threw it in there to test it out, and sure, and lo and behold, it was, it fit the bill. It was good enough. <laughs> and I'm all, hey, you know what? I I think that's fantastic. You know, why spend more money if you've got something lying around that fits the bill, uh, which is great. So she did that, and that's what I all. I mean, really, guys, we're not. You don't have to go out and buy new stuff every. You're not Rob. You don't have to go out and buy new stuff just because new stuff is to be that is there to be bought. You can not buy new stuff upon occasion and check things out. So, all right, that's great. Thanks, Abby. Thank you for the updates. Now, yep. Uh, well, yeah, and now that she's keeping that in her home theater, she'll be upgrading her home studio monitor, so she gets no studio monitors. Yay, I guess. It's no matter what, excuse. you get to buy new stuff, Abby. You're welcome. Spend <laughs> some of that oranges and new black money. So, uh, which I'm sure she's just, she rolls around in it at home. <laughs> I have no idea how much Netflix pays, but I can only imagine it's not... I don't think it's quite CBS money. I don't think it's quite like Big Bang Theory level money. You know, million I don't think it's a million dollars an episode Friends money, right? I don't think probably that's what... Probably not. Probably not. All right, Michael, one of the many... In our, oh, this is Michael who needed the help with the remote control. He is, uh, he's got some eyesight issues, and we told him to try out the D remote uh, based on a user suggestion, uh, one of our listeners' suggestions, uh, that was Bradley's suggestion. And he had already tried it out, but because we suggested it again, and we're obviously smart people, uh, <laughs> we just totally repeated what Bradley said, so Bradley is obviously smart people. Michael gave it another go and found out that it was much improved from la the, the last year, and that there was only some minor things he wanted, he wished it would do, and he's going to contact the developers on that, uh, which is great, you know, and that's yeah. a good reminder to everybody. If you found an app that didn't really kind of work for you, you know, if you see that still being supported, you should maybe kind of give it another go and see how it how it goes. I I am bad about that. I give it one try, and if I don't like it, I delete it and forget <laughs> all about it. So um, I actually have to help my I, my dad got an Android phone, and he's been using the iPhone all, uh, for a number of years, but uh, now he's got an Android. And he wants to get his music onto the, his Android, and I use uh. A program called I can't remember Double Twist. <laughs> Double Twist. That's what I use. But because he's got a uh, Nexus Five and Double Twist will free for free, it will pl you can plug it into your computer, uh, your phone into your computer, and it will download all your iTunes stuff. But it does the for reasons that I think is probably clear to everybody who's ever met Google and or Mac. Uh, when you plug in the Nexus Five into a Mac, it goes, Yeah, I kind of know that you're. There. <laughs> And it won't do that, so you have to buy it. Looks like a thumb drive to me. Yeah, you have to kind of, you have to get, you have to use a pay like air over the air transfer. It doesn't work all that well. So I'm looking for something else. Somebody's got to. I, I can, I'm almost waiting for Ray. To, Ray right now is typing. I need. I need something <laughs> else free that my dad can use to get his iTunes stuff on there. 
uh, I'd like something free or another something that can do it that because uh, uh, double twist uh, uses really low res like compressions like 128 or something. It, I didn't realize that until I listened to it really closely and went, wow, this kind of sucks. <laughs> uh, now, Michael is also, this is the same Michael, is hoping to sample some high res audio. He's looking for websites that offer free samples and tracks to buy. Uh, I found a website a while back, and so this shouldn't be too hard to figure out. But I found a website that listed um, high, like all the different little high end pl places, and a lot of them you could just press play. I don't know how high end the play is, hmm. uh, but I don't. You know, do you have any suggestions, Rob? Um, I mean, I. Also of note, Michael's in Canada, so not all of the services oh, that right. are available in the U.S. are available in Canada, at least for free samples and that. Um, I know Lynn, Lynn Records, yeah. uh, they give out samples and they have high res tracks, so at least I can point you to that one, just based on personal experience. Um, but I did find a website called uh, audiostream.com that actually ran a feature... This is like September of last year, but almost all these sites are still up, and I'm sure there are ones that have come since. But uh, they have a pretty darn comprehensive list of almost all the places online where you can get high-res um, music downloads. I'm not sure how many of these offer free samples, but we'll definitely put the link up on Facebook and in the comments over on avrant.com. Uh, so... By all means, uh, if you have the time, because I don't have the time right now, but if you have the time, check out the list and see if any of these fit the bill. So at least yes. it's some, uh, something sure of a resource. Gabe, uh, our listener, Gabe, who does listen to a lot of high res stuff, can, get, can point us in the right direction, so expect some more information about this next week and or after this podcast, if you are listening. Uh, all right, so now we're on to India. Well, I feel like we're just screaming. Oh, I just pressed the wrong button. Now I'm off my list. I feel like we're <laughs> screaming through this. We Feeling gotta try, good, man. So. <laughs> <laughs> Some oh, of these topics all... coming up are going to be long. <laughs> yep, we're only at 36 minutes, man. We're kicking butt and taking names. Uh, <laughs> Rohan, uh, I love that name, by the way. I wish my name was Rohan. That sounds awesome. He he rides a horse and he has a sword. That's all I have to say. Rohan, if you don't have, ride a horse and or have a sword, you should do one or both of those things because that's an awesome name. He's an engineer, and uh, well, if he's an engineer, he probably doesn't ride a horse. I've never known a right engineer that rides a horse. I don't know. That's probably some saddle sort of, engineer. I'm, that's probably stereotyping. I wouldn't want to do that or racial profiling. No, engineer profiling. I know a lot of engineers, which <laughs> makes me very jaded towards them. I'm married to one too, so and she has all sorts of negative things to say about it. <laughs> she doesn't really. They're very nice people, and they they probably own lots of horses and or sorts. Uh, Ra is an engineer, and he was quite discouraged by uh, how uh, subjective most audio equipment reviews are. Hey, Ron, me too, buddy. You and I are in the same boat on that one. Just trusting uh, his wife, his and his wife's own ears, they auditioned. Uh, by the way, good on you by including your wife. That's a smart move, sir. Uh, he, he did some uh, Dolly ones, and I don't recognize the model number, the Zensor 5 and 7. That may be a rebranding for uh, India, but uh, I don't recognize that particular one. Uh, the Mentors were uh, one of the, the top of their line. It's the Kef Q900s and Q700s, the Polk Audio RTI A7 RTI A9, and the Focal Chorus 726. Going in, uh, Rohan was expecting to buy the Dolly speakers. Guess what, Rohan? I would have expected to buy them too because Dolly pretty much <laughs> rules. Dolly is a great speaker company. They, I mean, not, I haven't loved every single speaker. I mean, I did the speaker shootout, and they kind of came in second-ish, second, third-ish, depending on who you're talking to, until people saw the speakers, and they went, oh, Dolly the best because they're the prettiest. <laughs> like, they, are, they make some really good-looking speakers. Uh, but he and his wife ended up liking the Focal speakers the best, and they bought them. And remember I said at the beginning of the podcast, Rohan made a mistake. What was his mistake? After he's purchased, he couldn't help himself. He went looking for reviews of the Focal Core speakers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, buddy. <laughs> Talk about drive yourself crazy. It's like buying a subwoofer that's not SVS and then going to a subwoofer to a forum and, and typing in, I just bought a sub, subwoofer for brand XXX and it's not, that's not SVS. I think it's awesome. What do you guys think? <laughs> oh, you wasted your money. Should have bought no. 
don't ever do this. What I I, I have very well first part of this podcast. I used to say to people, once you buy, once you go out and you make your decision and you buy something, you it's a six month blackout on search <laughs> searching for audio stuff online. Six months, dude. Take just, just enjoy build it into your, your firewall. Purpose. Anything but the word audio review it is <laughs> That's blocked. Right. Blocked. Parental control. <laughs> it's parental control. No audioholics. No <laughs> AVS forums. No AV forums. No uh, home theater review or whatever the ones that are out there. None of that. Six months. Anyway, so he per- he went ahead and le- did s- did some searching, and he couldn't find any objective ones. Hardly any Focal reviews at all. In fact, and then he started worrying. <laughs> oh my God! I bought these speakers that I really liked with my ears, but now that I bought them, and other people haven't said a bunch of good stuff to justify my purchase, I'm concerned that maybe I wasted my money. Guess what? Rob likes your speakers, right, Rob? I most certainly do, yeah. Um, Rohan was saying, first of all, he was saying that aesthetics were a big concern, so uh, not surprised at all that Dali was probably the front runner going in. Uh, yeah, but no by doubt. no means are the Focal speakers ugly. They're, they're nicely designed. They have really nice cabinets. Um, so yeah, as far as not hearing a lot about Focal online, uh, I'm one of the voices, because I recommend them semi-frequently. Um, I really like the design. Um, I like that they build all of their own components in-house, all of the drivers they use. Focal makes those drivers. They don't buy them from anyone else. And Focal is actually a big, big time supplier of speaker drivers to other companies. So there's a very good chance that you've heard Focal drivers and not even known it because they are acting as the OEM for quite a few other brands. Uh, Not to mention all of their car audio stuff, which is pretty high-end stuff too and well-regarded. So in terms of just giving you reassurance that you did not waste your money and that your R's... uh, R's? The heck is that? Ears? (laughs) This is how frazzled I am, folks. Um, That your ears did not lead you astray. I See, I was thinking of the word astray. I was already ahead of myself. You were that far ahead. Your that's, R's that's did not lead you, as, lead you astray. Okay, that's yeah, your did. R's did not lead you astray. Astray. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> the Focal speakers, the Chorus speakers, uh, the Electra speakers, the Utopia speakers, all of them. Uh, I like Focal's designs. I like their sound. They have the sound that I like, which is very, very linear response, very, very accurate, and very, very wide dispersion, wide even dispersion, which means you have a huge sweet spot and almost anywhere you go around, you know, to the left or the right of the speaker, the sound remains uniform and the same. Uh, That's my preference, so I think you made a great choice. I can give you that reassurance. All right, and on the other end of the spectrum, do not listen to anybody else, dude. You (laughs) went in and you came out with a speaker you loved. Don't listen to any of us. It does not matter what we think. The ma- the, what matters is that you think you got a great speaker, and I'm telling you, that's all that really matters in the end. You go home and you love that that speaker. That's all you need. <laughs> you got a great listening experience out of this, and you did the, the number one thing that you should do, and what so many people don't do, they listened. They went out yes. and they they had a short list and they listened. And boy, you, you were surprised. Well, you should be surprised. If you got them home afterwards and went, well, they don't sound the same as they did in the store, <laughs> then you got a problem. Okay? Well, I'm guessing that's not the case. So as long as you came home with them and liked them at home as well, it's all good, man. Go on, yeah. Got some, some, some good speakers. And I have not really heard that many Focal speakers. There's lots of companies that make their own drivers. Boston Acoustics, I've watched them make their own drivers. They have like mm-hmm. assembly lines and the whole nine yards. So there are companies out there that make their own drivers, and that, you know, that means that they can control a lot of stuff in, in-house. You know, and they make design, design decisions that you may agree with or you may not, that may agree with your ears or may not. So, uh, you know... Just that it, we can give you all sorts of reasons why the Focal are good speakers, but in the end, you like them. That means they're good. That's all that. And matters. you didn't even. It's not like you went in going, "Oh yeah, these are the speakers I'm going to get," and I, you know, that's that's the one I'm aiming for. And come hell or high water, that's the one I'm going to choose. It's like you went in thinking you were going to get something else, and these ones impressed you more with their sound. So that's right. by all means, trust your ears when that's the situation. Absolutely the right thing to do is listen and compare for yourself. Well, I, I mean, when yourself. I did that, uh, the 1500 to $2,000 speaker shootout back from Audio Holics, I think it was like in 2009, uh, Jay uh, Clark, Dina's husband, came in absolutely convinced, 
absolutely convinced he was going to like the Dolly's best. He had heard the Dolly mentors, the bookshelves, and loved them. And the Dolly speakers I had were not mentors. They were something else. I don't remember what the brand, what the line was. But he was convinced he was going to like them best. Mm -hmm. So we went through the whole thing, and he didn't. He liked the Salk sound, Song Towers or whatever they were the best when it was blind. The minute I took the screen away, who's a quick transparent screen, he went... Every 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 sighted test, he was like, "Oh yeah, those dollies are awesome. They're the best. They're the best." <laughs> I'm telling you, you know, if it's all if you went in there not expecting to like something and you liked it better than the thing you expected to like, you <laughs> liked it. Yep. You, you like that's like going in, you know, you know, going in to drive a Ferrari and a Honda, and you go, <laughs> "Well, I thought I was really gonna like the Ferrari, but this Honda rocks." <laughs> Believe me, you like that Honda. You don't need anybody else to tell you that. You know? <laughs> but if you have money for a Ferrari, you should totally get the Ferrari. All right. So we've had some questions from last week that we or a question from last week that we did not really address. This is from Will. Yes, Liz is Will, and it's all about home automation. As I said, if you are a home automation buff, we record on Tuesday nights, Eastern time at nine PM. Okay? Afterwards, we have a hangout where you can ask questions and hang out and just talk or just listen to us talk. And home automation is often a topic. Feel free to stop by, anybody who's listening to this, and we will help you. And by we, I mean all those people who do this stuff because it ain't me. <laughs> uh, so I'll read the question and uh, Rob will answer the question because sure. that's the way this is going to have to work because I don't do home automation. <laughs> uh I just can't. I'm telling you, I can't. I don't have a home theater where I can do it. It's in constant, constant flux. Uh, I just can't. Uh, there seem to be a few standards out there in, around automation. Some use smart bulbs. Some use smart switches. Uh, we are slowly, re we, meaning uh, Will and Liz, and their brand new house, are slowly <laughs> replacing our noble bulb bulbs with LED bulbs. My plan is to use dumb bulbs and then install smart switches. Do have have either of us? No, not me. Have either of Rob uh, looked into this? Uh, are there any good websites that can help you plan out your system? Eventually, we'd want to do more than just lights, then, like garage door, door locks, thermostats, you know, the the mood lighting in the in the dungeon. Uh, what you got, Rob? Alrighty, so the, probably the first and foremost one that you're going to find the most information about and probably the most recommendations for when you're looking at a do-it-yourself solution and not hiring a custom installer to actually come in and do all this for you for lots and lots of money in most cases. Um, the first one everyone's going to point you to is probably Insteon as a brand. Um, they are fairly low cost, but nice products, work well, and work on a mesh wireless network, meaning the more devices you add essentially the stronger the signal becomes because every device repeats the wireless signal to every other device that is in your home. So the network just gets larger and larger and stronger and stronger as you add more devices. Um, a great after, place to go... After 10 devices, it's called Skynet, though. They don't call it... <laughs> yeah. It's like your own personal Skynet, and if you make it mad, you're starts to attack you with <laughs> exploding bulbs. Yes, self-aware light bulbs. Um, but yeah, warning. a great place to go to learn about Insteon, uh, as well as a whole bunch of other products, is uh, smarthome.com. Um, that website is pretty much just dedicated to do-it-yourself um, home automation. And so Insteon is not the only product that Smart Home sells and talks about. Uh, they do Zigbee and Z-Wave and a bunch of other ones. Um, so that is probably the most well-known resource and well-known brand in the do-it-yourself space. That said, I really, really want to bring people's attention to Staples Connect. Uh, yes, Staples, the place where you go to buy your printer paper. Um, they have gotten into home automation in a big, big way. And they're actually partnered up with a company called uh, Zonoff, um, who basically just do all the back-end work. They're the ones who write all the software, uh, but Zonoff has done a terrific job in going out to established brands, brands like Lutron, who does lighting and automated shades, um, uh, Honeywell, which does uh, thermostats. Um, they've gone out to other companies that do like uh, smoke detectors and automated door locks and uh, smart doorbells and all this kind of stuff. So they've gone out to all of these disparate companies that were already in these spaces and said, hey, we want to put together some more of a unified system. We'll do all the software. We'll do all the work. And they created this smart hub, um, the Staples 
Connect smart hub that has a whole bunch of different communication radios in it so that it can talk to Lutron devices and it can talk to the Philips Hue bulbs if you happen to want to use them instead of Lutron and it can talk to uh, other programs and they are working on adding Insteon to it. Um, it already talks to Z-Wave devices. So the thing about the Staples Connect is that first of all it's like the lowest cost one I've seen. The hub is only $99 and it can control a huge array of devices. Staples, obviously a well-known name that you can pretty much trust and you can get hundreds of products already uh, on their website, but they've also actually set up in several of their flagship stores large displays um, where you can go and actually sort of interact and get some ideas right in the store. They don't have all the products available in store, uh, but they have a huge selection online. But more than that, if you are new to home automation, the, the whole thing with Insteon and even most of the stuff that's written at Smart Home, you sort of have to be the person who's willing to dig into it a little bit. You're going to have to spend hours looking at it and figuring it out. And Will is probably fine with that. Knowing I will Will, say, uh, will, will definitely is the type of person that would do that. But yeah. I think it's good that you're addressing this for people who aren't Will, because I'm yeah. not Will, and I'm interested <laughs> in this. Yeah, so I mean, not, not everybody is going to be willing to. And so the whole push with State Staples Connect is to make it easier to use, easier to understand. And so Zonoff is has to be given a lot of credit because it takes a lot of work. Like when we had George Tucker on here and he was saying how, you know, if you can use programming language, you can go a lot quicker, but then you run the risk of, well, first of all, obviously you have to learn the programming language, and then you can end up programming yourself into a corner where you just crash the whole system or, you know, you get into an infinite loop that you can never break out of. So Zonoff is doing all the work to make sure that you can have a graphical user interface, that it's much easier to program. And so for starting out, I would definitely say check out Staples. And um, there's a group called the Digital Media Zone. They do podcasts as well, uh, if you're not already familiar with them. They have a podcast called Home On, uh, where all they do is talk about home automation. Uh, the main guy who runs that podcast is all into Insteon, but he's really getting excited about the Staples Connect too. And they just did an episode, so I'll link up to that episode they just did, where they talk to uh, the representative from Zonoff, and they go into detail, and as well as some really cool stuff that's coming up for Staples Connect. So by all means, check it out, if nothing else. Um, it's, it's really well done. And for those of you that are sort of interested in this and uh, are intimidated by the whole thing or maybe you just don't want to do it yourself, don't discount completely custom installers. Uh, you know, if you have a fairly simple system, you know, one of the reasons custom installers get paid the money they get paid is because, you know, a lot of these other systems, it's the interface that is mm -hmm. the problem. You know, uh, when you get a Crestron system or a Control 4 or one of these other systems that are custom install based, you get a system that's slick, it just works, you get support, you don't have to do anything yourself, you know, I mean, this, you get the, the kind of device you want in exactly the way that you want it with all those special little apps and whatever uh, icons that you want, you know, it, it, it brings it to the next level. Uh, I had a friend of mine who wanted a specific type of system and he went to a custom installer and he came back with a price that while I thought it was something I wasn't willing to pay, it was not as much as I expected, and it was well within what he expected to pay. Right. And you know, it's not you're you're not going to walk into a custom installer and say, "Listen, I got a hundred bucks. What can you do for me?" They're like, "Well, I can shake your hand." <laughs> but if you go in there and you're like, "This is what I want. This is what I want my system to be able to do." They may be able to do that for you for a price that you'd be surprised at. So at least mm -hmm. give them a shot. You know, let's not let's not take it completely away and say, oh, if you're not going to DIY, then it's going to cost you a million dollars. That's not the case. It might, you know, it's going to cost you more than if you did it yourself. But then again, so do car repairs. So <laughs> hey, what are you going to do with that? Or in my case, doing your doing your car repairs yourself just costs you more money anyways, because then you have to get the guy to fix the thing that you fixed. <laughs> Last yes. thing I fixed in my car, I broke something as I fixed it, and it took th them three hours to figure out what I broke, which was just a cable. And uh, shut up, by the way. Everybody who's laughing at me right now. I'm, the fact that I even tried was just a, a monumental mistake on my part. Now, <laughs> we're going to get more Rob. This is the Rob uh, section of the podcast. Rob went to Paul's house. Now, if you remember, Paul McDonald uh, is our racing guy. He's going to put the decal on his car. Been promising this for like a year now. Can't wait to see it. <laughs> to tell him I'm driving the car when I see him. 
I, I, I didn't pass that along yet, but I, I will on our next visit, which might you be make tomorrow. Make sure that I get to drive the car. Yeah, okay. I, need, I need confirmation before I come to Canada. I don't know how I'm going to come to Canada. But if I ever come to Canada, I'm driving the car. All right. Anyways, he's going to put the decal of AV rent on the car. I might, have to, I might even change it. Well, I was going to say I could change my... I don't want to do that. Anyways, so he's got a big ugly dish in his backyard. You know, those big satellite dishes, the ones that you could, like, use as a hammock uh, back in his backyard. And he's turning this into an FTA, a free air system, or a, just a regular old antenna. It's huge. Well, right? so it, it should yeah, get like quite every, bad, yeah. <laughs> every channel on the planet, right? How does this work? Okay, so, yeah, it's not an over-the-air system. This is free-to-air. Free-to-air is satellites up in space sending down digital television signals. So this is not over the air. Over the air means it's a terrestrial antenna. It's a ten antenna that's somewhere on Earth and has a limited range uh, of broadcast uh, area that it can cover. Yeah, from, the, from your local stations, basically. Yeah, so, th so he's not turning it into an over the air system. He's turning this into a free to air, and that is getting the signals from satellites that are up in space in geosynchronous orbit. So it's a little bit different. Um, okay. So this was really interesting, and we spent quite a bit more time than I had initially anticipated. Didn't even get a chance to go out to his garage and see the cars. So, <gasps> yeah, I know, Matt. It's not like we didn't plan. Not like we didn't plan. You start with the cars. You start with the cars. I, I would have started with the cars. I'm sorry, <laughs> Paul. Paul, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry, Rob didn't start with the cars. He should start with the cars. You mm. start with the cars next time. Start with the cars. It's cars. He, you see, he, the cars he's got, like he's got cars on blocks around his house that are awesomer than any of my cars. I wish he was my neighbor. So, the way Paul's system was set up is that previously this was the C band, the analog, big ugly dishes where they were getting signals from satellites that are up in space, but it was analog television signals, and now the vast majority of those have been turned off. Uh, rendering his old system a little bit useless. So the reason that he had to go through a bunch of changes is because his satellite dish was connected to a control box, and that original control box uh, had uh, output signals that actually went to the motors that are in the satellite. So when you would tune to a certain channel that you wanted to watch, the physical, the, the actual big ugly dish itself would physically have to move. It would have to be aimed at the correct satellite up in space. So it's in a geosynchronous orbit, meaning it's always in the same location in the sky relative to you on the ground. So you can aim the dish at different satellites to pick up different signals. So we had his old box that had the controls to move the motors to move the big dish to point at the satellite that he wanted. But... All that original box could do was pick up the old standard definition analog television signals from outer space. So he had another box that could pick up the high definition ones, but that was also analog only. So all of that, all of that video part of it, the analog television signals, is kind of useless at this point. There's like one or two satellites still active. So what he did was he got this little teeny tiny box with nothing but an HDMI port on the back of it, basically which is now a digital box, and now there are satellites up in space sending digital television signals. That's the free-to-air system. Uh, but in order to get his big dish pointed at the correct satellites, he still needs that original box that has the controls to move the motors. So what was going on was that he had another friend over, because I didn't know anything about this, so he had another friend over who was there to essentially reprogram that original box because it doesn't have the coordinates for the new digital satellites. It only has coordinates for the old analog satellites, so it needed to be reprogrammed, and that involved getting a specialized little cable that would you could plug into a USB port, and you had to open up the old box and find this service port that was buried deep inside. You had to dig stuff out of there and plug into there and reprogram it, and actually that didn't all happen last Thursday when I was over because some of the instructions on how to do all that were not incredibly clear. So I'm kind <laughs> of glad I was not in charge of that part of it because I probably would have mucked something up. But I was there taking care of the rest of redoing all the connections in Paul's system, which this is no nothing nothing to say badly about Paul. There was something of a spaghetti mess of cables and wires in behind all of the equipment, uh, including, which I found 
I'm using uh, several cables that went nowhere. <laughs> um, <laughs> they existed. They were plugged into the AV receiver and then went around in a coil and through some zip ties and ended up connected to absolutely nothing on the other end. Nice. So this was like old equipment that used to be in there and got removed. And so we basically did most of the time cleaning all that up. So we got all that nicely done. Never got the original box completely reprogrammed. That will hopefully be happening tomorrow. Um, but one problem came up, which is that we just tried connecting the little digital box via HDMI to his television, and that all came up, and it was fine, but it was in 480i. And right in the menu, there was an easy thing that said resolution. So, you know, gave you the options, 480p, 720p, 1080i, 1080p. Said, okay, I'll put this over to, uh, you know, a high-definition output signal. Uh, and then it went completely black, and there was never a way to get it to come back. Yeah, you gotta reset um, it. There's gotta be some sort of reset. That happened. Yes, that happened. which was That's spoken, <laughs> which was spoken of in the manual, and it said press the master reset button, which had been removed from this unit and replaced with a little plastic cover. So there was no reset button, and I am not sure what to do. Um, so at this point, Paul has gotten in touch with the person he bought the little digital box from, and we're trying to work out a solution, and I feel really badly because it seems like I bricked his box, but all I did was try to change the resolution oh, yeah, down. that should box. not have destroyed I bet if you, the box. I bet if you just unplug it for long enough, it'll Maybe so. Itself. I'm hoping. Yeah. That... But the same thing happened, like, after the first podcast I did when my parents were here, they took the PlayStation, my brother's PlayStation 3 and put it on the big TV, which is they brought a big TV with them. I also brought a small TV with him. So my brother used a small TV in his room and a big TV. His t his PlayStation 3 has never been hooked up to an HD TV before. Oh, okay. It's always been it's always been a standard definition television, right? So we took it into the big TV. I was like, I'm doing this on 1080p. I mean, why wouldn't I? It's on the big yes. TV, right? Yes. Well, I brought it back in here. They brought it back in here, and I went to go do the after party thing, and. I could hear them kind of scuffling behind me and I was trying to <laughs> ignore them. Uh, and afterwards, I was like, what is the deal? Why are you people still up? We can't, we can't see anything. We don't know what to do. And my brother's autistic, and he does not deal with this stuff very well. Yeah. And my parents, being the parents of an autistic kid, they don't deal with it very well either. So I was like, hold on. Google's my friend. They're like, it told me to press the button. I'm like, hold on. Google's my friend. And I... <laughs> yeah, so you will fix it. I'm I feel sure of that. So don't worry about that. All right, great. Hopefully so. Yeah, we'll get some more information out of the the big ugly dish. Now this is part of the fun of AV. All right, how many times at eleven thirty have I been watching the movie and go, I didn't look right. Eleven thirty p.m. <laughs> I didn't look right. Maybe I'll just oh crap. What did I just do? My favorite one is when you sit on the remote and something weird happens and everything goes black. You're like. What? <laughs> you just stare at the screen. <laughs> I, my denim, I, my denim remote used to do that to me all the time. Like it, it would go into some weird audio mode, and I'm like, <laughs> "How did I? I can't even get out of it. What's going on? I don't understand." So hey, we've all been there. This is part of the fun, guys. This is part of the fun. So yeah, by the way, always taking some photos along the way and documenting it. So I'm sure it'll all end up on Facebook at some point. Yes, and then they'll end up on yeah on our Facebook too. Sure. Um, Michael D. Uh, he wrote, "I've noticed that new receivers do not play digital audio in Zone Two. That is not true, Michael. Almost no receivers play digital audio in Zone Two. <laughs> it's not just new ones. I currently have a Denon 1610 that will play all audio in Zone Two, digital or analog. It will uh, it will play in stereo, but it plays. Why does this older receiver do this, but newer ones don't? I'm looking to, per to upgrade to a new Di Denon Pioneer Yamaha. I'm not sure which one yet, but I want Zone 2 to play whatever audio I send to it. HDMI, iPhone, iPad, etc. Uh, Michael, the key word here is cost. Okay? <laughs> DAX cost money. Digital to, to analog converters cost money. And guess what? No one cares about Zone 2. Or zone three or zone four. That's the that's the god honest truth. You buy a flagship receiver, it's got five stupid zones of audio. You know how many of these are being used in ninety percent of the cases? If not more, <laughs> one. You get one home theater out of that bad boy, and everybody else is like, uh, I'm gonna use it to power the whole No, you're not. No, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not, you're not gonna do it. It doesn't happen. No, you're not. Now some people do. I would say upwards of five to ten percent of people who own these receivers do. That that might be a high estimation, but for the most part, they don't. So therefore, 
manufacturers do not waste money on DAX to Zone 2. If they do waste money on DAX to Zone 2, they normally will only do stereo, which is what you've experienced. They certainly won't be doing any surround sound or any of that. Uh, what we're seeing more of these days is like an HDMI, second HDMI output, which will go to Zone 2. That's on higher-end receivers, um, and that'll be they'll call it a Zone 4 sometimes because they're stupid, <laughs> but it's basically a second zone, which will give you the full 5 point, 7 point, whatever it is, it should give you everything. If they do digital audio to zone, uh, another zone other than the regular zone, they will tell you, okay? <laughs> it almost always will be someplace in the specifications because it's so unusual that they will tell you that they do it because it's a feature. It's a feature yeah. that nobody else does. Uh, if they don't say anything about it, they don't do it. I would say almost every case, they don't do it. Okay. If you're in the in doubt, you have to either scour the manual, uh, and it will only say something like in a footnote someplace about how it's only analog <laughs> in Stone Two, or you have to call the manufacturer and hope you don't get an imbecile on the line, which. <laughs> You're probably going to get somebody who doesn't know <laughs> now because nobody asks this question other than you. Um, I agree. I used to get mad about it. Uh, I, I talked to Gene about it five, seven years ago. We had a conversation. And I was like, dude, what's the deal with that? He goes, no one cares about Zone 2. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, I mean, basically what ends up having to happen is if you have, like, a CD player, for example, mm -hmm. right? You have, or better yet, a Blu-ray player. Blu-ray player is plugged in via HDMI, Right? And you want to you want to use that to play music in your zone two, which you have hooked up. Like my, I had my parents had a zone two back in uh, uh, in their house in North Carolina, and that was for outside. Okay, mm -hmm. they had two speakers outside. That's what they were using their zone two for. If you wanted to use uh, sound outside, even though you have an HDMI connection, you now have to connect the red and white RCA cables. Yup. To get something. To zone two. Uh, sometimes I've experienced that, uh, like your front input might be compatible directly to zone two, but usually it's still just the left and right. So it's not going to be. Uh, it might right. be the USB. I wouldn't bet on it, dude. So, uh, what yeah, do you I think? Mean, one of the oh. issues, yeah, one of the issues is that there are several sources now that don't have. They don't give you the option of using the red and white analog. Uh, audio cables like you no. know the, the new modern Apple TVs. If you get a little Roku box or something like that, any of you know uh, Xbox One, PlayStation Four, like you just you don't have the option of connecting stereo analog audio anymore. It's only HDMI. So I can totally sympathize with this, saying you know I've got this source. I'd like to be able to play just its audio in Zone Two. Why aren't they letting me do it? And yeah, I, I agree. It's just really just a matter of cost. I mean, one other issue is that if you're talking about something like Dolby True HD or DTS HD Master Audio, not only do, would you need an additional DAC, but you'd need additional decoders as well, because you'd have to have one decoder that's handling your main zone, then you'd have to have another decoder that would decode this lossless format and then mix it down to two channel and then turn it into analog, and send it out your Zone 2 output. So for the number of people who would ever make use of that feature, it's just not worth it to them. The only no, one no. I know of that I can point you towards, and I know <laughs> I know we've ragged on them for their processors and receivers, but it's Emotiva. Emotiva does this um, by what I've been able to find online anyway reading. They let you use basically any source with the Zone 2 red-white analog outputs. So... They're if, not the it, only one, though. I know some of the major oh, yeah, manufacturers yeah. do but as well. It's the, it's the only one I knew of off the top of my head. Um, yeah. So it, you can check them out. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Where are we at here? Oh, man, every I swear, after I climb, I climb today, my fingers are so rough that my mm -hmm. little trackpad doesn't recognize them. <laughs> and and I, like when I do a four, fingers, four or three finger, finger swipe, it doesn't do it right. We're at a little bit over an hour. Okay. Plug it away. Ron, decided to give Hyperion Audio Intimus 5T and 5C a try after we suggested them last week. He has some follow-up questions. Question one, what is your recommendation... Oh, this is the... A this is the okay, how to test speakers. The, uh, what is your recommendation for a way to A-B test the speakers with a home setup? Question two, when I compare the three front speakers, should I test them with or without my sub? 
Question three, if I test them without the sub, should I change the crossover setting on my receiver? That one hurts my head just thinking about it. Question four, <laughs> can you suggest some sources to use to test the speakers and what to listen for when I do these tests? Oh, Ron, we should have started with you, sir. This is a whole <laughs> podcast. <laughs> I'm tempted to skip Ron and come back to Ron, but now I've already sort of invested in Ron. All right, Ron, thank you for this question. Uh, we have not answered something like this in a long time. Yep. It's been a long time since we answered something like this. So let's go from the very beginning. How do you A-B speakers? Well, if you're there's a ton of ways to do this, and you can think of any number of ways. When I did the uh, the tower shootout, thing, I had uh, multiple amps going, uh, so I had multiple two-channel amps, I think is how I did it, or multiple four-channel amps, something like that, going between a receiver and I used or two re two receivers getting the same source or two processors getting the same source. It was all very mm -hmm. convoluted. So if you think about what you need, this is what you need to A-B a speaker, to, to A-B speakers. You need to be able to get the same source at the same time to both speakers and b have the ability to level match both of them. Okay, mm -hmm. and preferably you want everything between the this between the the very beginning where the power's coming out of the wall all the way up until the speaker gets the signal. You want everything to be the same. You <laughs> want the same. You know, I mean, this. I mean, if, yeah. you, if it's just for your own personal, then it doesn't really matter. <laughs> if I'm doing it, if I'm doing it for for a, like a review, I want the same length speaker cables. I want the same type of speaker cables. You know, I want them to be coiled in the same way. I don't want to give anybody any excuse for <laughs> why they didn't work. You know, I want them all to be sitting on carpet because cable elevators are stupid. You know, I want that. I want all the amplifiers to be the same. You know, I want them to be level matched. All that. So that's what you need. Now, how can you do this at home? Uh, well, yeah. Let should we go? Should we talk about that, or should we talk about placement first? Well, before we get to all that, I'd like to go on a little bit of a philosophical journey because Ron's situation is is a, like a lot of people's, which is not that he is necessarily trying to say, I am going to listen hypercritically to these two speakers and try and pick out every nuance and difference. He wants to say, should I keep... He, I believe he has the pioneer uh, Andrew Jones speakers, and he's ah. considering if, if I uh, spent a little bit more money... Could I basically get my money's worth? Is you know something for a thousand dollars for the front three speakers uh, going to be significantly better than the Pioneer speakers I already purchased? And so he's really looking for: is there a big enough difference that it's worth the extra money to me, or should I just keep what I already have? Okay, let's back up then. Let me let me back up here. You don't need to do any of this crap. Just set the speakers <laughs> up and listen to them. Because if you can't tell the difference, like if it's not like an amazing difference right away, then it's not worth it. <laughs> that uh, I mean, if you if it's not if you can't hear the thousand dollars or whatever it is difference right away, well then you're you you're fine. I think is how you would do this. But I still want to talk about how we're going to do yeah yeah a real but speaker. Just set. before that, but, I did want to say for for everyone who might be listening, here is something that I've learned about just listening in general, which is that when you sit down and you tell yourself, I'm going to be hypercritical of what I'm listening, I'm going to pick out all the differences, and I'm going to say, this tiny little nuance makes this speaker better than this other speaker. Throw all that out the window when you're trying to make a decision like this. My advice is, set up the first pair of speakers, put on some music that you know and like, start it playing, Figure out how loud it is. Get get the levels matched because you don't want to be swayed by just one speaker playing louder than the other. That one you want to get rid of as a variable. But yeah, other than that... That's an important one. Yeah, that's a really important one. But other than that, just put it on one pair of speakers and let them play and leave the room. Get up, walk out of the room, don't even sit down to listen intently and let the speakers draw you in. Go do something else, go make a sandwich, whatever it is, and let the speakers draw you in and then come down and kind of sit down and enjoy the music. Then an hour later, the next day, whatever it is, do it with the second set of speakers. Do the same thing. Make sure that they're equal loudness. That's a really important variable. But set up the second pair of speakers, put them on, same piece of music, same familiarity, but put them on, get up, walk away, and let them draw you in. Because, like Tom said, the difference should be non-subtle. Yeah. If you're looking at, is it worth the money, you should say, you know what, 
these sound so much better than the speakers I was listening to yesterday, or these sound so much worse, or I really can't tell the difference. And that will give you your answer. I don't know if I would go a whole like day. I think that's a bit extreme. I well, would. No. I mean, it's, I would it's giving, back, yeah. Back, 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 yeah. Back, back. It's, it's giving yourself that that overall impression because that is way more important than beating your head about tiny little nuances. If you're saying, "Is this worth the money?" It should be apparent. It should stand out to you, and you should say. I don't even care if these are technically more accurate or whatever. I just like what I'm hearing way better than what I heard with the first ones, or I like the first ones way better than these ones. And there's your answer. Trust well, yourself. Well, think about it from a car perspective, too. Everybody's shopped for cars before. Do you have to jump from the window of a moving car to the window of another moving car in order to be able to tell for sure, for sure, that you like one better than the other? No, you get in it, you kind of <laughs> yeah. sit in it, you get in the chair, you kind of drive around a little bit and go, ooh, this one's kind of, I don't know. <laughs> It's sort of high, like, I don't like high cars, like those big SUVs, mm -hmm. and I have a big SUV because I have a, three kids, so what am I going to do? Yeah. And a bunch of crap i got to take everywhere with me. But, uh, it, you know, it sits kind of high, or maybe it sits too low, or you don't like the way it turns, or, you know, the controls are a little weird, or, you know, something about it just doesn't feel right. So you get another car, you're like, you know, it's got that, it's got the right height, it just feels better to you. That's the way, if, if you're spending your money and you're going for, like, a, is this going to be worth my money to, to bump up, you need to make sure that it's, it, I mean, it should be apparent. It should be the difference between a Ferrari and a Honda. <laughs> I mean, not maybe that dramatic, or maybe it's a BMW. Uh, BM, you know, I, every time we do this podcast, I can't say BMW anymore. I have to say BMW. <laughs> I don't know why. During the podcast, afterwards, I'm all about BMW because I love those cars. But it, it should be BMW versus you know a Ford or a uh, you know a Hyundai or a whatever other Kias or something. It should be that apparent to you, or it should be like. You know, it's a Mercury, it's a Ford, it's the same thing. Yeah, okay, the interior's a little bit nicer, but <laughs> it's got heated seats, but whatever. You know, basically it's the same. If it's basically the same, then you're fine. Now, that's 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 aside. Now, if yes. you're going to do an A-B test, okay, uh, with just one receiver, you run into all sorts of little is issues here. Uh, we talked about level matching Uh for sure, you got. First of all, you want to level match the speakers so the speakers are playing at the same volume, and then you want to level match the the the, the volume that you're listening to during the the uh, the listening test from each speaker, each set of speakers to each other, so that one's not louder. This is because, and this is a well documented fact: if it's louder, you think it's better. Doesn't make any difference. If it's louder, you think it's better. That's just human nature. Okay, so you got to make sure the loudness from speaker to speaker is the same. Uh, sometimes you'll see uh, that they want you to place the speakers. Like some people suggest, you know, you put one set of speakers on the inside and one spe set of speakers on the outside. Generally, we don't suggest that. What we suggest is that you put, if if you have speaker A on the outside, uh, on the left side. Oh God, how do I say this? So you're gonna go stagger A B them. A B. You want to stagger yes. them A B A B, right? So on either side. Uh, and that way, they're kind of equal distance, and maybe you just kind of like move your head. And you're gonna do you want to do all the stuff that we talk about with toe in and playing with them until you get them to sound right where they're sitting. Okay. Now, in the best case scenario, you have some way of amplifying and level matching them so you can switch between the speakers uh, instantly. Now, I have never really played with the A, the speakers A, speakers B. Uh, mm -hmm. Features of a receiver. Have you ever really played with that, Rob? Yeah, I mean, I, I've used it. Um, can you level match it thing. Uh, You can level match it usually, but what you often cannot do is speakers B usually don't have any bass management. Um, and that is sort of coming into Ron's other questions about whether to use a subwoofer or not or where to set the crossovers. And so a lot of times speakers B are just full range and that's the only choice you have. And that can be an issue. So, I mean, I'll just roll into the next questions about whether to use subwoofers or, or where to set the crossovers because bass extension can really give you uh, a strong feeling of preferring one speaker over the other. Um, but it's sort of like a false positive. It, it's the type of thing where you go, oh, I like these so much better, but then once you start using your subwoofers again, uh, you're like, oh, 
wait a second, the treble actually sounds much harsher on these ones that I thought I liked better. It was just being masked by the fact that they play their bass a lot louder than the other speakers. And now that I've taken that variable out of the equation, I'm realizing I might have made the wrong decision. So, I mean, my advice is if, if you're using subwoofers in your system, and obviously we highly recommend doing so around here, um, I would say try to take bass as a variable out of the equation because it's so easy to get swayed by the speaker that just produces louder bass just as the same as if you did not level match the speakers you're almost guaranteed to just pick the one that is more efficient and is therefore playing louder. So my advice is try to not have the subwoofer playing or if you do have the subwoofers playing, make sure it's playing for both speakers. Don't have the subwoofer playing with one and not the other. Make sure it's you know the same for both. For a purely objective, trying to figure out which speaker is the better overall speaker, you mm-hmm. want to take the subwoofer out of the equation. That's that's a given. But the fact of the matter is, is that's not what's going to be happening. Uh, you what you want is a real you a real world use scenario. So if you're going to be using a sub with them, use a sub with them. Make sure that they're using a sub with both of them. And that way, you're actually seeing how they're going to perform in your room. It would be this. It, it is not unlike saying, "Listen to new speakers in your room." Why do you listen to them in your room? Because that's where they'll be used. Why do you mm-hmm. listen to? Why do you ABM with a sub? Because that's how you'll use them. You'll use them with a sub. So therefore, don't take the sub out. And what crossover should you set? Well, I'm tempted to say you set the one that is uh, that you'll be using the speakers at, but. I would say for this particular case scenario where you're actually trying to figure out which one you like better, I might go ahead and pick one subwoofer setting that's the same for both, that Mm -hmm. is good enough for both. So in this case, I would probably start with 80 hertz and just um, go there and leave it at 80 hertz. And that way it's the same for both. So you're only hearing the information around 80 hertz and up from the speakers and everything else is coming from your sub. Uh, If you... If your use case scenario in your house is, I don't have a sub, I listen to them full range, well, that's what you should do. Yeah, <laughs> that's what you do. Yeah, so I mean, ju- just just to give one example of how I set up my A-B test so that I could instantaneously switch between two pairs of speakers that I was comparing, um, but it's a little bit convoluted, but the way I went about it is, uh, first of all, I'm using an OPPO uh, player. Mine happens to actually be a DVD player from back in the day, but I'm only caring about audio in this case. So um, I use an OPPO player, and that has bass management built into it. So in the player itself, I can tell it to you know, set an 80 hertz crossover. And so that takes the bass out of the original signal that's just coming out of the player. I don't even have to worry about it at that point. So I can then feed that uh, into my receiver... And then I'm in the situation where I'm using external amplification. I have a separate amp, so I can feed the pre-outs from the main zone to two channels and use those to power uh, speakers A. And then I can use zone two um, to also go out to an external amplifier, same amplifier, so identical amplification across all, and that will power uh, speakers B. So now I can flick between them by just turning on, off, main zone, zone two. Um, and do that switch really quickly. So, I mean, that is one practical way that you could do that and take bass out of the equation, but not everybody's going to have that equipment or that capability, but I thought I'd toss it out there as a potential suggestion. Like I said, you can kind of throw around a lot of different ways of doing this. If you have external amplification, that's one. Using zone two on your your receiver, you know, if, if it has the ability to power a zone two, then you can do it that way as well. Just make sure you're using the same input yeah. from the, the the actual. So you'd, you'd probably want to go analog into your receiver, yeah. and yeah. then that way you can flip back and forth that way. There's all sorts of ways to do it. You're going to have to kind of wrap your head around it. Like I said, <laughs> I can't even remember how I did it for that shootout. I know there was at least two or three or four amps involved, and the amps themselves had power had volume control. So I was able to level match the speakers at the amp level, and then I basically turned off one amp and turned on the other while mm-hmm. the people were listening. And that's how I did the switching. Uh, it must have been two amps, because I remember switching cables and level matching between the tests. So <laughs> I must have just had the two amps, and I just basically switched on and off uh, mm-hmm. for them. And then I think they could control the volume 
which was a master volume, but the volume on the amp stayed the same, so something like that. Yeah. But uh, so, but the last question he has is, can you suggest some sources to use to test speakers and what to listen for when I do the test? Um, in Ron's case, you what you're listening for is, do they suck or are they awesome? <laughs> that. If you cannot come up with an are they awesome speaker, then you do not need to spend any more money. If you <laughs> go, these speakers are awesome, and these other ones I already bought kind of suck in comparison, <laughs> then I think the, your choice is clear. Now, if you're when I'm listening to speakers to test them for a review, it's completely different. Completely different thing. Uh, we've already given you some uh, resources on here. I'm sure Ron's, uh, Rob's. I don't know why I keep calling you Ron tonight. Rob's going to talk about it a little bit more. He uh, sweeps. You can start off listening to a couple of sweeps, and I know that sounds boring and lame, and, but it's a real easy way to see whether or not there is some sort of weird frequency response thing going on that is unique to the speaker. If you put this one speaker there into one spot and you listen to a sweep and then another speaker is right next to it, you listen to a sweep and one sounds like it goes well you gotta know there's something weird going on. Then I would then switch the location of the speakers just to make sure it wasn't just the speaker's location itself. But uh, you can listen to some sweeps. Obviously you want music that is as high quality as you can get and is actually something you will listen to on a regular yeah. basis. This is hey, if you mostly watch movies, watch a movie. If you mostly listen to classical music, listen to some classical music. If you mostly mostly listen to ZZ Top, well, listen to something else because ZZ Top. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> back in the day, I went to a, a a speaker listening thing, and one guy brought ZZ Top, and ever since then, I was like, seriously, ZZ Top, this is your <laughs> material, ZZ Top. I never really thought of them as like real high quality stuff, but maybe they are. Maybe I didn't know. Not the stuff he brought, but maybe they are. If that's what you listen to, that's what you listen to, and then you need a speaker that makes that stuff sound good. And yes, some speakers will, and yes, they're not the most accurate speakers in the world, but if they make the music you like sound good, it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, I, I completely agree with the sweeps. Um, I always start with sweeps uh, to, you know, to try and make any comparison like that, just to check out do these both sound like they have linear frequency response? Because uh, ideally they should. Uh, but after that, um, you know, I'm not going to tell you here's here's the particular piece of music that you should go out and listen to. Play the stuff that you're familiar with. Play the stuff you already like. That said, I do recommend uh, within whatever type of music that you like, you probably have some that has female vocals. You probably have some that has male vocals. Hopefully, you have some that's maybe uh, you know more. Uh, like a choir or at least harmonies, uh, multi-part harmony or something like that. So try and get isolated single voice um, as well as multiple voices. Try and get something that's very sparse, you know, only has a couple of instruments playing. Try and get something that's got, you know, more of a symphonic or an orchestral sound, you know. So tr give yourself a variety um, so that you're not just listening to, you know, really just one type of thing, unless that is genuinely all you care about. Well, you see, um, I think that, that ends up being the case with a lot of people. You know, if they're into hip-hop, they're into hip-hop, and that's sure. pretty much what they listen to. And, you know, but usually within hip-hop within, or within any genre, there is a range. There's the quieter yeah. stuff. And I really like quieter stuff to listen to when I'm doing mm. this stuff, where there's more dead air, there's more space. You know, you can really hear that those transient sounds of the speaker when the speaker has got some carryover and it sounds sort of muddy and there's sort of a noise in the background. Mm -hmm. You know, you want stuff that has got a, uh, some bass, you want some stuff that's got a lot of cymbals or a lot of high information so that you can, you know, you can find these things. You can find these things yep. within the genres that you like and as high a quality of music as you can possibly find, as well recorded, as well uh, mastered and mixed you know, and the highest bit rate that you can <laughs> figure out, you know. I mean, I really don't care. I mean, if all you listen to are MP3s, then that's what you listen to, you know. I've got friends, they listen to nothing but Pandora and Sp Spotify. And Spotify is pretty acceptable to me. Like, the, <laughs> the sound quality of Spotify is not too bad. Pandora is awful. I listen to it all the time. So I know that it's awful. But I still listen to it because it's convenient. If that's all you listen to, well, then listen to Pandora. Actually, get something better than Pandora. You, certainly, you have a CD. <laughs> but in terms of in terms of something that you might not be familiar with, uh, you know, comfortable with, um, 
really listening for in recordings. To me, the thing that, that sort of separates critical listening from just casual listening is delineation. Uh, when you are out at a live concert listening to live music being played, you can, if you want to, focus on one instrument or one voice. Your brain has the capability of filtering out almost all the other sounds so that you can just listen to that violin part or just listen to that voice or just listen to those drums. If you want to concentrate on it, you should be able to. And good speakers, a good sound system will let you do the same thing at home. You should be able to delineate between the instruments just like you would at a live performance. And that is a, a critical listening skill to be able to do that. Uh, so that's something to look for. Bad speakers won't let you do it. It'll all just turn into a mishmash. That's true. And I've been uh, reviewing, uh, and I'm almost done with my review, the PM1 uh, magnetic, well, planar magnetic headphones from Oppo, which are brand new ones. They're not out yet. Uh, they sent me a pair. I've been uh, playing around with them. Uh, and that's one of the things that I noticed right away was that that dead space, that that the transients, the ability for the speaker to the driver to stop mm -hmm. and between notes so that it's not overlapping in any way to the the sounds that are coming behind it allows you to drill down deeper into that music and hear more. Now that's why uh, reviewers will often say, "Oh, it was like a veil was lifted." What they're talking about is that they're kind of posers, but when they say <laughs> stuff like that, what they were actually referring to is the first person who started saying stuff like that, what they were referring to is this ability to drill down to the music and to hear more through it, okay? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a cliche now, it really yeah. is, and I try never to use that, but uh, the fact is that that's <laughs> It does kind of sort of apply that. sometimes, I ran into that myself, where it, it was like... Darn it, that's kind of apt in this yeah. situation. <laughs> it really sort of is. So that's just one of the things you want to listen to. Like, and, and you get a good mi a mix of different types of music. Female, male vocals, quiet, loud, high, low, lots of mid-range. The mid-range stuff is usually covered by the vocalists. Uh, yeah. So if the vocalists are sounding really good, then, you know, and uh, put, some uh, put some James Earl Jones on there and see whether or not you can, <laughs> you can get the... Just because you should. All right, we are going to run way out of time here. <laughs> uh, we're at uh, an, an hour. After Kevin, because Kevin 30. donated to us. So. That's true. We do have to get down to Kevin. Uh, okay. We could do David real quick. Okay. David would like to know what we think of the Darby Edition Oppo Blu-ray players and Darby in general. He's trying to figure out which Oppo player to buy, including refurbished options. Okay, and he also asked what was a room within a room, which we'll have Liz on hopefully soon to tell us what a room within a room is, because she'll have it. Uh, first of all, the Darby is a video processing. Uh, it's on the fly sort of like an, it's not quite an edge enhancement. It's well, they'd hate you for saying if it was, so. It's, yeah. it's, it's not that, but what it's supposed to do is it's a contrast thing to, to allow you to allow things to look a little bit more 3D. Mm. Uh, I saw that Cydia, um, Clint is very excited about it. Clint was very excited about this, this, this processing. The thing is, is the processing has been around for like 20 years. The guy, Darby, the guy who came up with it, uh, figured it out um, uh, you know, 10, 20 years ago, something like that. We never had the par processing power, the ability to do it until recently. Mm -hmm. uh, probably not, you know, it's probably been a little while, but he's finally got enough processing power and they, he convinced Oppo to put it into their players. Uh, the settings on it are pretty dramatic. You can go from zero to like over 100, like 120. I don't know what 120 Darby's are. Uh, but... Uh, <laughs> Oppo was saying something around 30 was where they suggested. Of course, at CDO on the show floor, they had it jacked all the way up to 120, and it looked awful. You know, it was all sorts <laughs> of all sorts of uh, artifacts created by it, which is what's going to happen when you turn your brightness all the way up, or your edge enhancement all the way up, or your Darby all the way up. Uh, I, as a general rule, don't like this sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sure that they have their place. Uh, I want not. I want a display that can make things look 3D. Actually, I want it to look 2D. But uh, <laughs> I would like a display that gives me a good image without having to have something else attached to it to to some post processing to 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 make it better. 
uh, I am sort of generally against this sort of technology. Uh, but I will defer to Clint in this, and Clint is excited about it, so therefore it must have some merit. What do you think? Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, I, I haven't seen it. So I can't, I can't say, yeah, this is absolutely something you should get or no, it's absolutely something you should avoid. Um, I've certainly heard both cases. My, my gut reaction to it is I, I just don't want to mess with the signal too much. I'm more in the Joe Kane camp of let's just get the accurate video signal because there are very, very specific calibration targets for video. This is not like audio where they're you know, is no really set standard video. There are very, very specific standards that we can target and either achieve or not. And Darby, by definition, will take you away from that target. So just on that level, I'm not a huge fan of it. I would say if if cost is a consideration for David, by all means, get a refurbished BDP-103. That would be my choice. That is your least expensive. It is a fantastic transport. I don't think you need Darby that I wouldn't be going for it myself. And unless you really, really want uh, analog audio output, um, there's no reason to go for the 105, because that is right. the only difference. So if you're using the HDMI connection, I'd say get a 103 without Darby, and if price is a factor, go ahead and get a refurbished unit, because you'll save some money. Yeah, uh, the difference between the different editions, really. Okay, so 103 has got like the high-end video stuff with a little bit of audio stuff. The 105 has got all that same high-end video stuff and now has a real dedication to the higher-end crystal clean audio as well. Okay, did I miss something up there? Analog audio. Analog audio. Yeah, because audio. via HDMI, if you're sending your audio via HDMI, that's not, they that's are identical. completely separate, right. We're talking about like they have like XLR outputs and stuff on it, if I remember correctly. So it's that's a you know if you're not worried about two channel stereo, you do not need the 105. What you in the Darby edition, basically, I don't know that it really changes that much from the 103 or 105. It just no. adds this Darby. It just adds Darby processing <laughs> to it. So if you're not interested in Darby processing and it's not something you really want to experiment with. I, don't, I see no reason why you need it. I honestly see no reason why you need it, no matter what. But I, it, it may be very cool. I have a feeling we're going to be seeing a lot more of it, to be honest with you. <laughs> I, I think it's going to end up in a lot of places. I think it might end up in your TV uh, mm -hmm. sooner rather than later. So we'll see how this works out. But the Oppo guys were in love with it. Clint really likes it. Oh. Uh, so... I just I don't think you really need it, though, do you? Now, he also asked what a room within a room is. The simplest way to think about this is uh, sound travels really well through solids, especially bass, okay? And it does that mechanically, you know, you, you know we talk about the subs, you lift them off the ground onto a sub dude or some sort of platform or rubber feet or something, something that decouples your subwoofer from your floor so that the sound waves don't travel through the feet of your subwoofer into your floor, out through your house, and to your neighbors and everything else. <laughs> uh, a room within a room decouples the room. Okay, It actually takes the entire room and, me and mechanically decouples it as best as it can from the rest of the house. Uh, it's expensive to do. Uh, it, you're basically you have to have two walls and there's all these different little special ways of doing it and you have to have I, I mean we could talk more we probably will talk a lot more about it in the future but <laughs> on, on its, its simplest case it's basically a room that is not that there's some sort of rubber or dampening material between that room and the rest of the house right yeah I mean yeah just to give a Quick description, uh, just take a room, imagine any room you've got, uh, an enclosed room, let's say it's a rec room, uh, you take down all the drywall, and you remove whatever flooring you have, so you've just got, let's say it's just a concrete slab on the bottom, and then you just got studs, and you just got ceiling joists above you, and that's all you got right now. You're going to use some kind of, uh, usually rubber, sometimes people use springs, but you're going to build a floor on top of the existing concrete floor uh, that is, you know, cushioned by either these rubber things or by springs. Then you're going to build walls on top of the floor that you just built. So now, now you have studs that are inside of the existing studs, and then you're going to 
uh, brace across the top of those with new ceiling joists that sit on top of the new studs. So you have literally built a room within the room that other than the springs or the rubber on the ground is completely detached from the studs that you started with. And then you're going to drywall the inside of this new room that you created. And it's, so it's all about soundproofing. That's what a room within a room is all about. It's stopping any noise coming from outside your theater from getting into your theater or more likely the loud noises from inside your theater getting to outside your theater and bothering the people who are trying to sleep upstairs. So that's yeah. what it's all about. So do you need a room within a room? Not yes. if you don't have somebody <laughs> who complains, basically. <laughs> if you don't have somebody who complains, you do not need a room within a room. That's <laughs> what it comes down to. Okay. Kevin. No, you need it. You need it. Everyone should have one. <laughs> You got some issues, dude. Uh, absolutely do not. I'm so happy that my I wife know. doesn't complain I'm about bass anymore. It's so it's so nice. She used to she used to come out and shush me all the time. It used to drive me <laughs> nuts. Uh, this is great. This room that I have is great. I can't wait till my brother moves out. By the way, my parents bought a house, so oh. uh, they actually have put some money down on it or whatever, and they're in the you know they're doing the inspections and all that other stuff. But in 15 days or so, they will have a house. But they're making, they're immediately doing renovations. They got it for cheap, so now they have to change some stuff. Not have to, but they get to change some stuff. And uh, so they may be here for another 45 forever days uh, <laughs> until they get the house the way they want it, and then they'll move into it. And uh, at which case, I will have my own theater back, which will be awesome as well. Now, last but not least is Kevin. I want to remind everybody: you go to avrant.com. You can donate there. For uh, to to support the podcast, if you want to contact us, Rob at AV Rant, Tom at AV Rant, uh, Facebook.com slash AV Rant Podcast, our offline rant line four seven nine off rant four seven nine six three three seven two six eight, and at First Reflect or at AV Rant underscore Tom for our uh, Twitter accounts. Uh, now, are we going to post this PDF over uh, somehow? And oh, I don't know. I'll have to ask. Uh, Kevin, we'll if have to ask Kevin because he's got an idea. By the way, he has. We, we I imagine he won't want to post all of it because there is a picture of him in there. Oh so, yes, that's probably true. Yeah, that's he's probably not going to want to post any, all of it, but maybe we can post some of it. So we'll have to see. Kevin wanted to discuss the idea of stacking multiple speakers for one channel. Uh, what sort of loudness increase will he get when it, uh, when he wires them in parallel? What's what? It, why isn't this more common? What are the pitfalls versus the benefits? Now, uh, he's got a bunch of images and how he plans on doing this and basically if you think about a speaker that's got a tweeter and uh, a tweeter offset with a mid-range that's offset to the other side and the woofer underneath is like a bookshelf speaker if you take that you take another one you put it on top so the tweeters are in line the the mid-ranges are in line though offset and the uh, the woofers are in line though they're in the center but so one speaker is kind of sitting on top of the other speaker Okay, and he's got three channels of this up front. I think he's got more of them on the side. I don't really know. I didn't really pay attention to the side ones, but I think he's probably doing that on the side as well. Uh, his idea is uh, a lot is in the in the order. Like he sent us some pictures, and I've seen this before of people who want to do something similar to this, like to send pictures of line array speakers, which are speakers that uh, are very tall, usually six, seven, eight feet tall, and they have a bunch of tweeters down one side. All in a line, array in a line, and maybe mid ranges, or maybe not even mid ranges, maybe just more tweeters. Like Macintosh used to make speakers like this all the time, or they were just like <laughs> three rows of little quarter sized tweeters, uh, usually inverted because why not? And instead of having conve uh, convex uh, little cones, they would have concave little cones. It used to drive me nuts. It looked so weird. Uh, and, and this would be a line. It's what we call a line array. And the idea of a line array is you get this wall of sound that comes at you, okay, uh, from top to bottom, you know, and therefore it sounds more natural. Uh, and line arrays have got really big uh, proponents, and there's people who really, really love them, and they're supposed to be fantastic. I've heard a couple at... Uh, Trade shows and wasn't impressed, but that's mostly because I hear them at trade shows. So and they sure. they put those things out on the main trade. Like I don't even put them in a room someplace. They just put them in the main floor and say, "Look how loud they can get!" Like, yay, it hurts my ears. Uh, so Kevin's idea is he's going to stack these speakers one on top of the other, kind of uh, so that the the top of one is on you know so one's one's right side up and one's upside down. I'm making all sorts of hand gestures for those of you that are watching this. Uh, what 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 can he expect 
uh, what sort of loudness increase will he get if he wires them in parallel? Rob? Uh, well, the sort of loudness that you would get, uh, because we're talking about higher frequencies, we're not talking about big, gigantic bass waves, where if you stack one subwoofer on top of the other, uh, you end up getting about a 6 decibel increase. With speakers, if you do this and you're driving them off the same amp, that's what he's talking about, is using right. one amplifier to drive both of these speakers. Now, wiring them in parallel means that since they're identical speakers, you will be cutting the impedance in half. So if right. they started off as eight ohm nominal speakers, now you are running two separate sets of speaker wire from one amplifier channel. One set of speaker wire goes to the first speaker, one set of speaker wire goes to the second speaker, so you have two paths for the power to go down, you cut the impedance in half. So now you would have a four ohm nominal speaker in this case. So he was wondering, okay, do I get six decibels of increase of that? No, you don't. It's still the same amplifier, one amplifier channel, driving two speakers, you get a three decibel increase mm. in power when it's these higher... Shucks. What's up? No, I said, ooh, you only get three. Whatever. Yes. Uh, the real problem you're going to run into here, Kevin, is the sort of thing that we talk about a lot on this, and that's interference. Uh, you're going to have a tweeter that is... Two tweeters that are going to be trying to play the exact same thing closest to each other, but hmm. not as close as speaker designers would put if they were going to put more than one tweeter in the same box. Uh, and I want, you know, and, and you can look around and see that there is a very, very, very rare case. Now, you can find them, and I know you can. Uh, even RBH, one of my very favorite speaker companies, did it, and they stopped doing it, but they did it to have more than one tweeter in a box. Uh, those guys really know what they're doing, and when they decided to do a no-holds-bar speaker, they went back to one tweeter. Uh, you're going to run into some I issues almost uh, uh, certainly with interference, where the, there's going to be some cancellation stuff, there's going to be some weird stuff going on there, uh, right there. At just with, and We're just talking about tweeter. We haven't got to the mid-range. Yeah, yet. yeah the, the rule of thumb is that um, if you're going to have two physical things vibrating back and forth, producing the exact same frequency at the exact same time, physically they need to, to get it actually working as a point source, to get it working as though they were just one uh, diaphragm moving back and forth instead of two separate ones, they would have to be within one quarter of the wavelength of the sound that they're producing. Now when you're talking about tweeters, you're talking about wavelengths that are like two inches when you're getting really high. So they would both have to be within a two inch span in order for them to act as one instead of creating interference. As soon as you get to half a wavelength apart, so you're talking like one inch apart, if you're talking of a wavelength that's two inches long, one inch apart, you run into all sorts of weird <laughs> cancellations and, and wave interactions that happen because you've got the wave coming from one of those drivers traveling downward, the wave from the other one traveling upward, and where they meet, you get this weird lobe-looking thing that comes out at you and sounds very strange as soon as you move your head in any given direction. So that is what you're up against, and that's why it's not commonly done. <laughs> Right. It can, like I said, it can be done. It's been mm -hmm. done by speaker manufacturers, and uh, the best speaker manufacturers that I know of don't do it or stopped <laughs> doing it. Uh, if What you're looking for here is more sound to come at you. You're going to get physically more sound to come at you. That's going to yeah. be the case. Uh, if you're looking for better sound to come at you, I don't know that adding more of the same speakers is the way to go. What you need is be either better quality speakers, uh, and I'm not saying the ones he's got are bad. I have no idea what speakers he's driving. I'm just saying, in, in general, if you don't like the sound that you're getting or you want more of it to come at you, you either need better quality speakers or speakers that can handle more power. Uh, yeah. This, is, you know, why, it, his, it, 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 why isn't this more common? It's not common because it, does, it doesn't tend to give you what you think it's going to give you. Uh, and I actually, there I saw a very heated argument on Audioholics one time from somebody who wanted to do just this and they kept referring back to line arrays and they would refer to spe yeah. you know speakers at, uh, at movie theaters where they would have multiple speakers along the side walls and mm -hmm. say they're all playing the same thing how come I can't put 15 speakers in the front of my room playing the same thing well you can 
And that's yeah. what it comes down to. You can do whatever you want. I don't care how many speakers you put in there. If it sounds good to you, then you can tell me to shut up, and I don't know what I'm talking about. And guess what? I'm fine with that. <laughs> try it out if you really want to try it out. But from a from the, the technical standpoint of why isn't this done, it's not done because it's generally not going to give you the results that you really want, which is and better sound. Also because if you were going to spend the money for two speakers and let's say two amplifiers, or at least one at least very capable, powerful amplifier that can, I mean, you have to remember that we're talking about dropping an 8-ohm nominal speaker down to a 4-ohm nominal, but that 8 ohm nominal speaker might have dipped down to 3.2 ohms at one point by itself. You just yeah. wired two of those in parallel and now you just drop down to 1.6 ohms, which a lot of amplifiers will not be happy trying to play. <laughs> they will so, happily smoke at you. Yeah. So if you're talking about from the cost point of view, um, you know, normally if you take that same amount of money that you would have spent on two speakers and two amplifiers and you just put that into one higher output speaker that uses one tweeter, um, you'll end up with better sound for the same or less money. So just from that standpoint, there's that to consider. But the other point I want to get to is um, he was asking about maybe having one center speaker above the screen and one center speaker below the screen, um, which is something that's been done and it doesn't always sound terrible. Um, Folks who uh, we were talking with Ray Coronado after one of the shows, and and that's actually something that the the Oro system does. The Oro system puts a regular front, left, center, and right, and then they have height left, center, and rights above it. And uh, he was saying that it sounds pretty awful. So <laughs> whether you actually want to have one speaker elevated above the other one, both playing the same thing, is debatable. What you need to realize though is that you cannot think of one speaker above the other as being a stereo image. Uh, if you have one speaker to your left and one speaker to your right and they're both at the same height and they both play the same thing at the same time at the same volume and you're sitting in the middle in between them, it will seem as though the sound is coming from directly in between them. That's in the horizontal plane. That is going with our horizontally positioned ears on the left and right of our head. When you put one low and one high, you do not get the sensation that the sound is coming from directly in between them vertically. Our ears don't work that way, unless you turn your head sideways. I guess if That's you want to exactly listen to everything. Said, the Oro guys exactly said that. Yep. The only way they could get that stereo image from the height channels was to turn their head sideways yeah. so that their ears, one ear was lower than the other. Yeah. That was the only way they could do it. So if you're thinking that by having one speaker above your above your screen and one speaker below it, it will make it seem as though the sound is coming from dead center in the middle of the screen. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way. We don't get stereo imaging in the vertical plane unless you cock your head sideways, and then you just lost your stereo imaging from side to side. <laughs> so... <laughs> so the really, I, it really is. <laughs> yeah, I think what Kevin's hoping for, because I, th I think he already has these speakers, and these are like on-wall speakers, and he's he's got a large open sort of concept room, so I think he's just wanting louder sound. I, I have a suspicion that right now he's either getting some distortion when he tries to crank it up, or he would just like things to sound clearer and more intelligible, because maybe it's just not filling his space adequately. And if that's the case, this will get you a little bit louder. It'll get you 3 dB louder. I'm not at all convinced it will make it sound any clearer. In fact, it could be quite the opposite. Um, it will be like having multiple surround speakers, which gives you this oddly diffuse sound, not a nice pinpoint, crisp, highly intelligible sound. It gives you something that we're, we try to simulate with bipolar dipole speakers uh, you know, that are in a trapezoid shape that you wouldn't want to use at the front of your room for nice, solid imaging. So, eh, <laughs> I don't think this is the best way to go, Kevin. <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it, like I said, you've got the speakers and you want to try it, try it out. If it works for you, it works for you. Uh, from a technical standpoint or from the standpoint of uh, the theory, uh, not being in your room, not knowing where you're sitting, not knowing how these speakers operate, uh, you know, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, it shouldn't, the reason why people don't do it is because they, they, they don't want you know, to do that thing <laughs> they're doing. <laughs> Pretty much. You know, all right. I've been in all sorts of different theaters with all sorts of different ways people have placed speakers, so have at it, I suppose. Uh, no, the pitfalls versus the benefits. I'm not. The benefit is that it, you'll you'll have more loudness, you'll have more sound at you. The pitfalls are that the sound might not be 
it may actually be worse than what you're expecting, <laughs> yeah. what you had before. Uh, that's that. How much time do we have? We have time for anybody else? Or are we done? We're done. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, well, we'll have to apologize to the people that we're missing. Um, who are we missing? We got Michael M. Yeah. Uh, Yes, we got Michael M. He's got some questions about uh, an acoustically transparent screen and sonically matching all, or, uh, yeah, he wants to get a sonic match across all three of his front speakers, which are all the same speaker, all right? Or does he, have a, does he have a center channel? Uh, no, I think one is a center channel. I think okay. so. Okay. Pretty sure. So he's worried about that. Uh, Tom, who's not me but is in Australia and is not me, uh, has a, a subwoofer that he wants to get another one of or a different one and wants to know which one we think he should get. G. Uh, and uh, he wants to know how we can help him get his wife appro wife's approval, which which I say, good luck, dude. And uh, no, I mean, I mean, hey, I've got some, I've got some techniques, dude. I don't know if they'll help you out. Uh, I don't know if I'll help you so out. So we probably. will, we will, we will be getting and to Gary. those questions next week. And Gary, Gary right. that's right. Oh Gary my goodness, with Dolby yes. Vision, Dolby Vision, we got that. And then the. The, the additional high res stuff that we keep putting <laughs> off is going to continue to be put off. Abby and Gabe, not that we don't love you, we do. We just have talked a lot about that, so we're going to have to save that for next time. All right, we did all the contact information a bunch of times. Do you have anything else to add, Rob? Uh, well, uh, if you'd like to do recommendations, I actually put them at the bottom of the list so that we'd come to it at the end of the podcast. What's um, the I did kind of want to. Oh, there I it did. is. Yeah, right there at the bottom of the list. Go on. Come on, dude. Um, so uh, <laughs> I thought that was just a news story. <laughs> this is something that was uh, tweeted out. Uh, full disclosure, I haven't listened to this thing yet, but I think it's interesting and worth potentially checking out. Um, it's called Dr. Chesky's Ultimate Headphone Demonstration Disc, and the reason I am bringing this up is because it touches on a whole bunch of topics we've talked about recently. First of all, this is a binaural recording. So if you want to check out the whole binaural effect, which is supposed to give you the sensation I'm through clicking on it right now. There yeah. I go. Look at me clicking on it. <laughs> it's give you the sensation through earphones that you are not listening to earphones. It should give you the sensation that you are listening to the live event with all of the weird reflections. They used a dummy head dummy head with an upper torso, so it's supposed to capture all of that head-related transfer function, special uh, you know, reflections and stuff, um, and come through the earphones and give you that sensation. So, first of all, it's that. Second of all, they're offering it in three different versions. It, I you just saw it. that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at 16-bit, 44.1 kilohertz, which is CD quality, 24-bit, 96 kilohertz, or 24-bit, 192 kilohertz. Yes. At $12, $18, or $25, respectively. Yes. So if you yourself would like to check out whether or not the resolution, the bit rate, the sampling rate makes a difference. You can buy difference. this three times. You can buy this, well, at least twice, right? You probably want to get the CD and maybe the 192.24. Just get the, the largest gap that you can. First of all, you're taking you know, room effects, whether or not your speakers are good enough. You're taking that other question because you're going to be listening to these through earphones, through headphones. Um, so you're taking that part of it out. Uh, these should be, by all accounts, because these were really, like, a lot of time was put into mastering these. So these should be the utmost quality possible for these various resolutions, these various bit rates and sampling rates. You should not have things like odd dynamic range in one versus the other or clipping in one versus the other. These should all be really, really well mastered. So you should be able to make a fairly apples-to-apples -apples comparison of it's whether... an hour and a half long if you buy the whole album. It's an yeah. hour and a half. But, so it's uh, AIFF check it out. format, uh -huh. uh, ALAC, FLAC, or WAVE. Mm -hmm. Don't get WAVE, dude. You'll be here forever. <laughs> Those are big files. I know. I might have to go with FLAC. Probably. I probably, probably I'm probably just gonna go ninety six twenty four. I think that's good enough. I, mean, I don't sure. they really. I, I honestly don't think I need to go past a forty four one sixteen. But that's I'm right. Of, that's I'm what afraid, we've been debating. <laughs> I'm afraid. I'm afraid if I if I don't get it, I'll like lose my audio file card. If I well, that's the whole me. question, right? Find out whether we can actually. Whether... I'm not buying this thing three times. <laughs> what look well, like? Made of money? I'll, I guess I'll have to do it. It's, not, it. it's certainly not going to be me. <laughs> You're the one with all the speakers. I got three kids. I don't get a bunch of speakers. I got three kids and a bunch of rolled eyes. That's what I get. <laughs> all right. 
that's enough for one night. Thank you, everybody, for listening. If you're going to stick around for the Hangout afterwards, we are looking forward to talking to you. Uh, for AV Rant, I'm Tom Andre. And I'm Rob H. Now go out and listen to something. And once again, guys, we'll see you in five minutes or so.